HRC, 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 Hebrew Reader, Hebrew Reader, Hebrew Reader Church. Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Kasafo. I'm your brother, Zachwa. We hope you all are enjoying the Shabbat today. We thank you all for taking the time to join us. Thank you all for checking out the content, sharing the content, checking out the website, videos, and also we appreciate your support and your prayers and everything that you do in helping build this great family environment here at Hebrew Readers Church. Uh, today, we're going to continue building from where we left off. The last lesson we talked about the mind, body, senses, our purpose. And now we're going to get into the spirits and things that are against that purpose of fulfilling Allah commandments and walking in his ways and the fruits of his spirit. Uh, Zakwa, anything before we get started? No, I'm, I'm ready to go, brother. Right. All right, let's start in the Testament of Reuben, chapter 2, verse 3, please. Seven other spirits are given to him at his creation, that through them should be done every work of man. All right, we discussed this topic in the mind, body, and senses lesson. You have the first is the spirit of life. The second is the sense of sight. The third is the sense of hearing. The fourth is the sense of smell. The fifth is the power of speech. The sixth is the sense of taste. The seventh is the power of procreation and intercourse. And there was an eighth spirit, the spirit of sleep. Those were the eight spirits we discussed in the last lesson that were given to help us perform the works of Allah Hayyam. We should know in simplicity what Allah Hayyam requires of us with all the spirits he gave us to help us fulfill his requirements. Can you read Micah chapter 6 verse 8 so we can see what that is, please? He have showed thee, O man, what is good. And what do if Allah require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy? and to walk humbly with thy Allah Hayyam. He requires that so he may fulfill his purpose for making us. All right, and let's see what his purpose for making us is. Wisdom of Solomon 2, verse 23, please. For Allah Hayyam created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. Once we are doing justly, obeying and walking according to his law, loving mercy and walking humbly in his ways, we will become immortal in that sincerity. Now, today, let's look at the spirits appointed against man to lead us away from the duty of man to keep the commandments, doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with Allah Hayyam. Can you read... Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 2, please continue. With these spirits are mingled the spirits of error. So, with the eight spirits to help us walk humbly, we also have the spirits of error mingled with those to cause us to error from our purpose. Can you read Testament of Reuben, chapter 2, verse 2, please? Seven spirits, therefore, are appointed against man, and they are the leaders in the works of youth. From a youth, there are seven spirits that are leaders. So, they're not the only spirits at work. They just are leaders amongst the spirits appointed against us to work evil in our youth. Let's learn about the seven spirits. Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 3, please. First, the spirit of fornication is seated in the nature and in the senses. Okay. Spiritual fornication is the cause of all evil 
as we will learn today. Here we see this spirit of fornication is first in the war against us from our youth. Fornication is seated in the nature and senses. So through lust, the root of the devil's wickedness, it's empowered to seat itself in the nature and senses of mankind to lead us unto Satan. Now, in regards to it being in the nature, the definition of nature is the innate or essential qualities or character of a person or animal. Firstly, fornication can get in the senses of any of creation, animal or person. Now, fornication can manifest in our character or qualities as a person, causing us to have qualities or characteristics that are unseemly, according to the word of Allah Hayyam. For an example, let's look in. This woman in Proverbs chapter 7 was an adulteress struggling with the spirit of fornication. Yet, her struggle isn't only shown in how she wanted to sleep with a man that wasn't her husband. So we can understand how fornication is actually, it affects more than just the desire for carnal union. Let's look at it in Proverbs 7, verse 10 to 12, please. All right, the spirit of it. Thank you. Let's see. You're welcome. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. Notice here, you can see how the struggle with the actual spirit of fornication can be seen in how she carries herself and operates. It can be seen in how she's dressed immodestly, her subtlety of heart and craft to seduce and overcome a man, her loudness and how she talks instead of being of a meek and quiet spirit, being stubborn in her pride instead of humble, bowing down her ear to listen, and her unwillingness to be a keeper at home, as is fitting for a wife to exalt the doctrine of Allah by being a keeper at home, guiding her house. But rather, because of the struggle with the spirit of fornication, she wants to be out and about in the streets, lying in wait to entrap someone with her beauty, to lust after her, and her subtlety of heart to get them to fall by her crafty words. So you can see, just as we're getting into it, that the spirit of fornication, it affects more than just the desire for carnal union. Now, okay. jump in as you will, please. Uh, I was just going to say that it, it it shows itself the same in a man. So if you see a man struggling with the spirit of fornication, it's going to be shown in the way he carries and operates himself too. Because he's going to be crafty, to seduce. He's going to be loud. He's not going to want to be taking care of his family or at home. He's going to want to be out in the streets. Uh, it's, the, it's the same. The spirit operates the same. For sure. Now, and at some point in this series of lessons or discussions, we're going to get to seeing the different effects the spirit of fornication has on a man as well. I'm going to touch for the men and women. It's going to be a good sit down. Allah, I am willing we get good understanding. Now, because of the sin of man, the spirit of fornication through lust is innate in all mankind and has place in us from our youth. The precepts helps understand the hurdles everyone has to overcome. Can you read Second Edges, chapter 3, verse 21 to 22, please? For the first Adam bearing a wicked heart transgressed and was overcome. And so be all they that are born of him. Thus infirmity was made permanent, and the law also in the heart of the people with the malignity of the root, so that the good departed away and the evil abode still. So this is why the spirit of fornication through lust, the root of the devil's wickedness, 
or through the root of lust, fornication is the first against us in every person. All right. Sirach 17 and 16, please. Every man from his youth is given to evil. Scriptures show we all are inclined unto it because of that mistake and that root that's been implanted in us to lead us astray. We all have this battle to overcome. The evil that's at work, that the spiritual fornication leads unto, and also other evil spirits lead unto. Continue, please. Neither could they make to themselves fleshly hearts for stoning. This really helps understand Allah really controls all to leave us in a hard heart, struggling to obey. And he also has mercy to turn the heart of whom he wills to obey wholeheartedly when he sees that effort is a true effort to change. You may remember Paul referencing that Allah hardeneth whom he will and has mercy on whom he will. He really does, because as this verse said, we can't make fleshy hearts ourselves. It's Allah that does it. Knowing the spirit of fornication is against us through lust from our youth. We have need of nurturing the Lord to be trained up in the right way to go and also praying the Lord be gracious to circumcise our hearts to cleave to him since he controls repentance himself. Can you read Proverbs 20 and 9, please? Who can say I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. It's not possible. We can't get rid of the hard heart and spiritual fornication ourselves. As remember, we battle against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's nothing to glory in of ourselves when or as we see we're coming out of it, or when we're delivered from it, because it's Allah Hayim that does it when he sees the soul is worthy of repentance by the effort the person is putting in to change and do right. Can you read Hermas Parable 7, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, please? Yeah, I just want to touch on something before you go forward. The um, One of the actual fruits of the Spirit is power, and that actually gives a person the ability to change. So as Casa is saying, it does come from Allah Hayim. Um, You have to be given power as a, one of the fruits of the Spirit or the Holy Virgins to be able to actually make a change, to be able to change. So just wanted to throw that in there for understanding. Great understanding. It's great. And is to get to power, you have faith and continence that comes before it to show the effort we have to put in to actually get there. So, follow him to grant it. But it does also help know what to pray for. Pray for the power to change. Hermes Parable 7, chapter 1, verse 4. But behold, sir, say I, they have repented with their whole heart. I am quite aware myself, saith he. That they have repented with their whole heart. Well thinkest thou that the sins of those who repent are forgiven forthwith? Certainly not. But the person who repents must torture his own soul and must be thoroughly humble in his every action and be afflicted with all the diverse kinds of affliction. And if he endure the affliction which come upon him, assuredly, he who created all things and endowed him with power will be moved with compassion and will bestow some remedy. And this will Allah do, if in any way he perceive the heart of the penitent pure from every evil thing. So see that Allah will do it if he perceives the heart of the penitent is pure from every evil thing. And that goes back to Zachary's comment and seeing that faith and continence, it takes faith and believing that if we keep ourselves from all evil, we shall be saved. And that continence to keep from evil, Allah I am seeing that we actually are pure from every evil thing. 
then assuredly he who created all things and endowed them with power will be moved with compassion and will bestow some remedy. He'll give the power to change. He'll deliver us from the affliction. But we actually have to endure the affliction with cheer. Because we understand it's for a purpose. What he's putting us through is for our good. Everything that comes from him is for the good. As Paul said, don't wax faint when you when rebuked of the Lord. For whom he loveth, he chasteneth as the Father loveth the Son, or chasteneth the Son. Now, we see wholehearted repentance alone is not going to get us where we need to be. We also have to go through afflictions and actually put work in to grow and be thoroughly humbled in every action. That's what we must be. There's no avoiding that. We must be humble in every action. Now, let's understand more about this opportunity of repentance. Mandate 4, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, please. So those then that were called before these days, the Lord has appointed repentance. For the Lord, being a discerner of hearts and foreknowing all things, perceived the weakness of men and the manifold wiles of the devil, how that he will be doing some mischief to the servants of Elohim and would deal wickedly with them. The Lord then, being very compassionate, had pity on his handiwork and appointed this opportunity of repentance and to me was given the authority over this repentance. So Allah knows what the devil's doing and he knows the weakness of men. So he's given us this grace period to grow. This great grace to actually get it right and to learn through the affliction and the experiences we go through. And through that experience, we learn patience and we learn hope and we understand ourselves to know the things that are actually good for us and not good for us. And in the light of today's discussion, where fornication is at work and where it's actually fidelity at work, faithfulness at work, he gives us time to learn ourselves, but we can't take this opportunity for granted because Allah is a spirit and he sees everything. If we come in hypocrisy, not willing to work and actually put in the work, and when I say we'll be willing to work and actually pull in the work, we have to be willing and obedient. Not just willing in word, but actually indeed implementing, learning, taking experiences, building off of them, and just pressing towards the mark. If we don't come in that right way, but we come in hypocrisy, he sees where our heart really is, and he won't give us repentance. Can you read parable 8 of Hermas, chapter 6, verse 2, please? Wherefore then, sir, say I, did they not all repent? To those whose heart he saw about to become pure and to serve him with all the heart, to them he gave repentance. But those whose craftiness and wickedness he saw, who intended to repent in hypocrisy, to them he gave not repentance, least happily they should again profane his name. That's straightforward for us. Okay. Knowing this, let us work hard for our salvation to be found worthy of repentance, to have our hearts changed to flesh and circumcised in spirit. Mandate 4, chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, please. But I say unto you, saith he, if after this great and holy calling anyone, being tempted of the devil, shall commit sin, he have only one opportunity of repentance. But if he sin often and repent, Repentance is unprofitable for such a man, for he shall live with difficulty. I say unto him, I was quickened unto life again. When I heard these things from thee so precisely, for I know that 
If I shall add no more to my sins, I shall be saved. Thou shalt be saved, he saith, thou and all, as many as shall do these things. Hold on, please. Then you get to understand what a hypocritical repentance is. But if he sin often and repent, repentance is unprofitable for such a man, for he shall live with difficulty. If we find we're staying in the same struggle and not growing and advancing, we need to reason as to what we're what our if our purpose is right, what is our what are we really seeking after? Because we can't continue to fall in something if we don't desire it or have pleasure in it. Okay. And it's precise what the angel said to Hermas. It's precise that if I shall add no more to my sins, I shall be saved. And the angel confirms it. Thou shalt be saved, and all as many as shall do these things. So this is the requirement for us all. We have from the beginning, we have that root in us, and we have work to do to overcome that battle. But if we get to the place where we add no more to our sins, we're consistent, we shall be saved. If you don't have anything to add, continue chapter 4, verse 3 of Mandate 4, please. Preserve purity and holiness, therefore, and thou shalt live unto Elohim. All these things which I speak and shall hereafter speak unto thee, guard from this time forward. And from the day when thou was committed unto me, and I would dwell in thy house. But for thy former transgressions there shall be a remission. If thou keepest my commandments, yea, and all shall have remission. If they keep these my commandments, and walk in this purity. So, we actually have to guard. We have to work. And be attentive, slow down, pay attention to the actual warfare that we're in. And we'll have remission if, specifically if, we keep those commandments and walk in purity. Okay? Hope that helps for encouragement that salvation and deliverance is possible and understanding the reality that salvation comes with hard work and patience waiting on Allah to see the effort and deliver from the struggle as we are dependent on him. And when he does deliver, it's nothing to glory in ourselves because it was all his doing. So it's a blessing to give him thanks for and to continue humbling ourselves. We'll have to also remember to pray to Allah to deliver us, to see our faults and not pass over them without taking accountability to work and change so we don't be given over to pride and lust to stay where we are, repenting in hypocrisy. This is a process we all have to go through. Even righteous men went through it. You can see Sirach's prayer to understand. It's through prayer and understanding what to pray for. This is a part of taking the experiences to understand ourselves, to see where we're lacking, to learn what we need to pray for so that we can actually be delivered. All right. Uh, Sirach 23, verse 1 to 5, please. All right. O oh Lord, Father and Governor of all my whole life, lead me not to their counsels and let me not fall by them. Who will set scourges over my thoughts and the discipline of wisdom over my heart, that they spare me not from mine ignorances, and it pass not by my sins? Least my ignorances increase, and my sins abound to my destruction, and I fall before my adversaries, and my enemy rejoice over me, whose hope is far from thy mercy. O oh Lord, Father and Elohim of my life, give me not a proud look, but turn away from thy servants always a haughty mind. 
Turn away from me vain hopes and concupiscence, and thou shalt hold him up that his desire is always to serve thee. Hold on a minute. You can see here, hopefully you can see here, that he went through experiences to learn the things that kept him from being able to do what's right and was praying that he be delivered from those things. Deliver me from a proud look, because if I have a proud look, Elohim is not in all my thoughts. There's another spirit there. But turn away thy servant always from a haughty mind. Keep me from getting lifted up in anything, because I'm aware now that that gets another spirit going in me, and I won't be able to do what's right before you. Turn away from me vain hopes and concupiscence. Concupiscence is intimate desire, lust. So he's asking for deliverance from his own desires, from any desire contrary to Allah Hayyam, or hope for anything contrary to the will of Allah Hayyam, vain hopes. If they're not Allah Hayyam's will and hope for us, it's vain. Because the single-minded man, Issachar, talks about it. He waiteth only for the will of Allah Hayyam. Okay. And thou shalt hold him up that is desirous always to serve thee. He got the experience to see if I'm always desirous to serve Allah, I'll be held up. I can't go wrong that way. Knowing that we need Allah for this, he said, Who shall set scourges over my thoughts and the discipline of wisdom over mine heart, that they spare me not for mine ignorances and it pass not by my sins? This is what Allah does. And that's something we have to actually want and look forward to, knowing it's a purpose. I want to be corrected. I need to be corrected. Because if I don't get to see what's going on in me, I'm going to pass over my sins. I'm not going to be ignorant to what's going on. And in my ignorances, because I didn't want to be corrected or I didn't want to be wrong, because I had a perception of who I am or who I want to be. That's not accurate, but I uphold it anyway, not want to be corrected. At least my ignorances increase and my sins abound to my destruction because I didn't want to see myself or I didn't want anybody else to see who I was. I would avoid the corrections or avoid the wrong that I see I'm doing or avoid the conscience burning when I'm doing something wrong. And my ignorances and my sins are going to abound to get me to my destruction. Because there's another spirit at work that's leading me to that destruction. That's not what Allah would lead me if I was desirous to do his will. Okay. Lord, when we get to that place where we're simply always desirous to serve Allah not ourselves, so that we may be held up in the faith. Anything else, Zakwa? I would suggest that people go and catch the, uh, go watch the catching the lie lesson. Um, because what happens is, is when you, it's just like, let's say I have a brother and my brother falls, right? And I know my brother did something wrong, right? But instead of speaking truth and saying, hey, you fell in this or going and speaking to someone and saying, hey, I seen such and such and such. They fell and they did this. Right. Instead, I will act like it never happened. Knowing I know what happened to my brother, knowing I know exactly what he did, I will act like it never happened. And it's the same thing as far as the spirits and the way that they operate. Because if I don't speak truth and I lie and say, hey, I didn't do that, or hey, that's not what I meant, or whatever the case is, where I'm justifying the action, I'm allowing the evil spirit to stay because I'm not calling out the iniquity that the evil spirit is doing in my vessel. 
Henceforth, it allows the evil spirit to stay and to continue operating. So when it when it speaks like um at least my ignorances increase and my sins abound to my destruction, it increases because there's no truth. You're not speaking truth because you you have the desire or the spirit of fornication is actually leading you to lie so that you can continue to fulfill the desire. And that's how people get stuck in a desire because they're not being truthful and honest and really trying to get that spirit out. But instead, they're trying to cover for the spirit so that it can have a place to, to dwell and continue operating. So we have to be mindful of speaking truth always to ourselves and to others so that we're not covering for no iniquity and no evil spirit to have a place and, and dwell with us. Sure. And along with that, also know if there was a certain intent but wrong came out of the situation, there is a spirit that was at play and took away that good intent because the evil spirit was there. So we can also know, even if it's, if you may feel like, ah, oh, that's not what I meant to do, but it ended up being what you did, know that, okay, it's an evil spirit that was involved according to scripture. So we still have to actually confess that fault to help rid of that evil one. All right. Don't let the, the justification be that my intent was good, but it just didn't work out. You have to be completely honest and truthful. Yes, sir. Thank you. Praise Allah. I gotta add, by doing that honesty and confessing faults and not hiding any iniquity, you're helping become that new creature you're seeking to be in Christ. Because the old man has to die and think of it like, if you will, maybe chinks in the armor. There's a facade that we've created. We talked, what lesson was it? Narcissism lesson where we talked about the facade, the false self, narcissism and pride, maybe. Yeah, the exaggerated sense of self. That's emotional. Yeah. So if we can be honest with ourselves, we've created a false self of who we are. When faults come up, it's showing who we really are. And that's that old person we want to get rid of and mortify. So when that work is shown and we confess that and take accountability for it, that's helping us die to that person that we were so that we can become a new in Allahayim. That's along the lines of why Christ said, he who shall lose his life shall save it. But he who shall save his life shall lose it. We can't preserve ourselves or our image of ourselves in this walk because Allah sees that that person isn't right. And we have free choice. So we have to choose to not want to be that person. And then he'll give us help. And it helps understand to be thankful when a fault is shown because, all right, that old man I want to actually get rid of is being exposed. Great. I'm getting to see what's going on so I can better be aware and take the necessary steps to overcome. You can't fight in a war blindfolded, unwilling to see the enemy. Now, continuing and understanding fornication in our nature and senses. Another definition for nature is inborn or hereditary characteristics as an influence on or determinant of personality. Inborn can mean natural to a person. So we can understand that from what we just discussed, since fornication is against us from our youth, it can become natural to us since fornication is against us from our youth. And also, it can become a natural 
way of operating through experience. So that means that fornication can influence or find place in us through our own experiences or the household environment we came up in, making it become a natural thing for us to do or operate in because that's what that's the environment we were around that folks were operating in that spirit. Now, hereditarily, hereditary can mean it's passed from parents to descendants. So hereditarily, it can have place in us wherein the sins or struggles of our fathers is the same struggles we have to overcome. As literally some tribes of people, is that's the case. Fornication is a spirit that's just a battle for them, so they have to be aware of it from a young age, as is the case for a few tribes of Israel as well, whose fathers admonish them about the spirit to help them overcome it. An example in Levi chapter 9, verse 9, if you will, if you don't have a comment. Beware of the spirit of fornication, for this shall continue and shall by thy seed pollute the holy place. So you can see it can be a hereditary struggle as well. So fornication, can, it comes from different angles, okay? Now, in regards to the senses, fornication works especially in the eyes to arise the evil desire and in the love of pleasure to let sin enter in, okay? The spirit of fornication affects our perception and outlook or how we hear and how we speak, and even how we feel about things, which also affects what we hear and how we hear, or what we feel and how we feel, and what we speak and how we speak. For an example, can you test him in Joseph chapter 7, verse 8, please? For if a man have fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it, even as she, whatever good thing he may hear with regards to that passion he receiveth it with a view to his wicked desire you see how was given to a wicked desire which fornication will lead us to everything we hear we see it according to that desire we have because we want what we want and we're seeking a means to fulfill that all right. Reuben spake out fornication. In fornication is neither understanding nor holiness. So it doesn't see right. It doesn't see what Allah wills, but is seeing according to its desires. And let's see an example of somebody actually being in that struggle with fornication where they can't grasp with the reality of things because of their desire. Can you read Testament of Joseph, chapter 7, verse 4 to 7, please? And when I saw the spirit of Belia was troubling her, I prayed unto the Lord and said unto her, Why, wretched woman, art thou troubled and disturbed, blinded through sins? Remember, if thou kill thyself, as Theho, the maid wife of thy husband, thy rival, will beat thy children, and thou wilt destroy thy memorial from off the earth. And she said unto me, Lo, then thou lovest me. Let this suffice me. Only strive for my life and my children, and I expect that I shall enjoy my desire also. But she knew not that because of my master I spake thus, and not because of her. So you see, through her desire... And her sins, she heard it in the manner she wanted to hear it, in a manner that would be according to her desire, and used it as a means to fulfill her desire. So you just you can see, for example, how the spirit of fornication it deters us from seeing and doing things in truth or understanding the truth, or what's really going on, to even project onto people. She just projected onto him. Her mindset was that he loves her and he's doing this for her. So she projected that and that's what she actually believed because of her struggle with fornication. All right. That was um, 
when Joseph was in the prison, that was the Egyptian woman, so that everybody can track with the story. That was when he was still in the house. He was just trying to do and say whatever. Right before the whole event came that he had to go to the prison. Right. Now, we're getting to see some things about this spirit. The spirit of fornication also affects the way we carry ourselves and the way we choose to dress even. We had touched on it a bit with the woman in Proverbs 7. You know, she had the attire of an harlot, and it was with intent. She wanted to be desired. And let's see other scriptures. That's the case, what happens when struggling with fornication. Testament of Joseph 9 and 6, please. But when I was in her house, she was wont to bear her arms and breasts and legs that I might lie with her, for she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned in order to beguile me. So we can see the spirit behind what's going on is to arouse desire when a person, whether man or woman, are bearing the parts that are precious in them to get a reaction. It's unfortunate in the world. It's pretty common, but the world is in the loss of fornication. So that's what's behind all that for understanding. Fornication also affects how we take in a smell or taste or something we see to arise desire. Can you read Ezekiel 23 and 14 and 16, please? And that she increased her whoredoms when she saw men portrayed upon the wall the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. You see, the spirit of fornication at work in her, when she saw that, she doted. She fell into lust. So you can see how fornication actually affects the senses as well. Okay. Fornication also affects how we operate in the manner of how we do things, and as mentioned before, how we carry ourselves. Can we read Isaiah 3 and 16, please? Moreover, Isaiah saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. See how fornication affects the way a person dresses and carries themselves, and the intent in what they are doing so as to arouse desire or get attention as opposed to walking in the fruits faithful to Allah dressing modestly covering the things that are precious in our body parts and carrying oneself soberly and shamefacedly can you read first timothy 2 and 9 please and like men are also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety and see the difference from what the calling is and then also on the other side what the spirit of fornication leads unto we had referenced that verse in Isaiah because the women were struggling with being haughty and haughtiness fornication teaches arrogance so one, had, one would be struggling with the spirit of fornication if one is struggling with pride and stretch for us next, being stubborn, just as we read in Proverbs 7, that woman was stubborn. And the wanton eyes, eyes that are lustful, to get others to lust, and lustful in itself. And the way being in that fornication, you can see it in how a person carries, walking and mincing as they go. There's the, I don't know what the call is, you know, that walk that women do. And also men have their own version of it on the male side of when one is in the spirit struggle with fornication. I'm talking about fortune. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the term was exactly. <laughs> but just this we're just touching on things to see like fornication. If you know what you're looking at, fornication is not hard to see. The spirit. Mm -hmm.
especially in the countenance. Now, Lord willing, we'll get into talking about these things as we go along in the series of discussion on the topic of fornication. But now let's continue looking at the spirits against us. So we kind of touched on that first spirit, fornication. Um, let's continue in Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 3, please. The second, the spirit of insatiableness in the belly. Insatiable, by definition, of a desire or appetite incapable of being satisfied. So this is a lack of contentment or a struggle with covetousness or greed, if you will, when it comes to our eating, more so in our belly, but insatiableness can affect us in different areas. We have to be prayerful for a right mind to be considerate of our health and pray not to be given over to the greed of the belly or the lust that will cause us to be intemperate when it comes to our diet and fleshy desires to overcome this. Sirach 23 and 6, please. Let not the greediness of the belly nor the lust of the flesh take hold of me, and give not over me thy servant into an impudent mind. We went back to that prayer that we had read earlier from Sirach, seeing, experience, understanding, taking those experiences and learning what to pray for. Help my mind. Let me not be given to that impudent mind so that I don't give in to the greediness of the belly or the lust of the flesh. All right. We touched in the last lesson about Allah created us for his uses, like our body. This is something he gave us to take care of. So we ought to do that in our diet as well, maintain our health. Sirach 37 and 29 and 30, please. Be not unsatiable in any dainty thing, nor too greedy upon meats. For excess of meats bringeth sickness, and surfeiting will turn into collar. So we see even the scriptures encourages us not to be insatiable and gives us understanding of how that stuff actually has a negative effect on us. Continue the admonitions for our diet, please. 31, Sirach 31, verse 19 and 20, please. A very little is sufficient for a man well nurtured, and he fetcheth not his wind short upon his bed. Sound sleep cometh of moderate eating. He riseth early, and his wits are with him. But the pain of watching and collar and pangs of the belly are with an unsatiable man. So we see the scriptures is for our help to eat properly so that we can be well even in our sleep. Continue in verse 12 and 13 of chapter 31, please. If thou sit at a bountiful table, be not greedy upon it, and say not, there is much meat on it. Remember that a wicked eye is an evil thing. And what is created more wicked than an eye? Therefore it weepeth upon every occasion. So yeah, it helps with guidance through the scriptures. In righteousness, we eat for strength, not for overfilling ourselves. Can you read Ecclesiastes 10 and 17, please. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. It's a good mind that we're talking about and we're working on to not be given to oversatiating ourselves. Um, Testament of Benjamin 6, verse 1 to 3, please. The inclination of a good man is not in the power of the deceit of the spirit of Belier. For the angel of peace guideth his soul, and he gazeth not passionately upon corruptible things. He sateth not himself with luxuries. You see, when Allah is guiding us, we won't have that evil eye of coveting after things, and we also won't be seeking to satiate ourselves with the luxuries, overeating, and things of that manner. 
we would actually eat as is sufficient for us, not given to the desire of pleasure in eating, to overeat for the pleasure it gives. On the other end, we would be content with our lot and place in life, so the desires doesn't lead us to depression to overeat as well. That's tying back to that Issachar. In Issachar chapter 4, he talks about he only waited for the will of Allah Hayim. Okay? Being content and thankful for whatever we have. Anything in that category, Zachar? No, I'm good. Okay. Let's continue to the third spirit that's against us. The Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 3, please. The third, the spirit of fighting in the liver and gall. Okay. Can you explain this one, Zach, or how the Simeon goes with this, please? Yeah, the spirit of fighting. Um, I'm going to read the Testament of Simeon, chapter 2, verse 4. For my heart was hard, and my liver was immovable. And my bowels without compassion, because valor also has been given from the Most High to men in soul and body. For in the time of my youth, I was jealous in many things of Joseph, because my father loved him beyond all. And I set my mind against him to destroy him, because the prince of deceit sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind, that I regarded him not as a brother, nor did I spare even Jacob, my father. The spirit that is against us is the spirit of fighting. And the opposite of that, what Allah has given us, is valor. And that's what Allah wanted us to use it for, is to have valor toward Allah to uphold his laws, to uphold his commandments, to uphold his fruits of the spirit. We have to have valor to do that in situations. But you can see how that valor turned into the spirit of fighting where it gets used in a negative connotation and you can see what goes forth with it Simeon said his liver was immovable and his heart was hardened and his bowels were without compassion so we see how that spirit of fighting if we're not using that valor that Allah had given unto us in the right sense toward righteousness how that can also be used to do evil. Uh -huh. What's that for him for that? Praise Allah. I expect that at 37 Timothy he said he's given us power, he's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. He gave us the strength to actually fight to do what's right. You good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Oh, also, we see here because valor, what do you say? Because valor also has been given from the Most High to men in soul and body. That's something to pray for as well. Pray for valor to fight and do right. To have courage to do right. Now is courage in battle. To have courage to go through this battle and overcome. The next spirit, Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 4, please. The fourth is the spirit of obsequiousness and chicanery. That through officious attention, one may be fair and seeming. Look at these definitions of these words here. <laughs> Obsequiousness means obedient or attentive to an excessive or servile degree. Obsequiousness describes a situation in which a person obediently serves someone else and is eager to please them. But remember, this word said to be fair in semen, so it's not genuine. It's with a ulterior motive. The synonym for obsequiousness is fawning, which is displaying exaggerated flattery or affection. 
So they're trying to win the person, trying to gain them. Another synonym is ingratiating, which means intended to gain approval or favor. So you can see the obsequiousness, the flattery, the affection, the excessive attention trying to be servile to the person is to gain approval or favor from with them. So it's not genuine. Chicanery is the use of trickery to achieve a political, financial, or legal purpose. So the, all of that obsequiousness that they're doing is trickery to achieve something. It's not genuine. And then officious, because he said that by officious attention, through officious attention, one may be fair and seeming. Officious means assertive of authority in an annoyingly domineering way, especially with regard to petty or trivial matters, intrusively enthusiastic in offering help or advice, interfering. So this is that overbearing, making small things great, petty things, and just going real hard about it, similar to being over much righteous. It's trying to seem righteous by being by over complicating things or being involved in everything, offering advice and help in everything they can with the intent of being fair and seeming. It's also to gain you or to get get something from you or to gain your approval. The um the officious seems like when they're in the the right about something they will harp on it. It says assertive of authority in an annoyingly domineering way, especially with regard to petty or trivial matters. So they will hold that matter when they're in the right so that they can have that moment of being the, the person who did what was right and is pretty much being able to look down on another. Yeah, for sure. Could the this the struggle with this spirit is trying to want the vainglory. They want to be held, be seen as fair. They want to be seen as good or right. So definitely, when opportunity presents itself, they're gonna hold on to that and be on it instead of the plain man, like. We read the definition of perfect in the so lesson a while back of Jacob. It's unassuming. Like, eh, yeah, that's the right answer. And that, and you keep moving. It's not about making that moment about you, you know. So this obsequiousness and chicanery through officious attention is essentially doing the most to be liked or please someone, being overly attentive to them or overly involved in their affairs but it's insincere, as it's just to get their admiration or acceptance to be seen as good in their eyes, or win them over, if you will. Right? But to be better than them. Yes, sir. Because it says, intrusively enthusiastic and offering help or advice. Yeah. Yes, sir. Intrusively. It's not that they're asking if you need help. They they see an opportunity to be right and get to lord over you. They're taking it. Mm -hmm. So that's the spirit that's against us, or spirits that's against us. And you have to watch because it's in here. It's in the world. Uh, an example of it is Sirach thirteen and six, please. If he have need of thee, he would deceive thee and smile upon thee and put thee in hope. He would speak thee fair and say, what wantest thou? Well, this was a rich man. When he needs you, he's going to be your best friend. Seems like he, he's there for you. Likewise, it can happen for any person when they have a need. So for us, being genuine, sincere, doing things because it's the right thing to do unto Allah And if we do something, we're doing it out of our desire to do good rather than gain something from it 
or gain someone from it will keep us from falling into these spirits. Um, if you don't have anything, Testament of Romans chapter 3, verse 5, for the fifth spirit, please. The fifth is the spirit of pride, that one may be boastful and arrogant. We've discussed pride, and it works in that lesson called the spirit of pride for reference. So you can reference that. Continue, please. The sixth is the spirit of lying and perdition and jealousy to practice deceits and concealments from kindred and friends. We also discuss lying in the catch the lie lesson for reference. And you have examples in scripture of the struggle with the spirit in Amnon and Absalom. They both were deceitful, concealing their true intentions and desires when making requests of their father David to fulfill their desires. And continue to the seventh spirit, please. The seventh is the spirit of injustice. Injustice is lack of fairness or justice. Continue, please. With which are thefts and acts of rapacity that a man may fulfill the desire of his heart. This is where from a youth we are led by this spirit to be selfish or unjust and unfair, aiming to fulfill the desire of our hearts by theft or aggressive greed, taking what we want or doing what we think we must do to get what we want without consideration of how it affects others or without compassion towards how it affects others if we go for what we want. Continue, please. But injustice worketh together with the other spirits by the taking of gifts. So gifts helps blind us to help injustice operate, making us respect persons to do others wrong for the sake of our desires. Judas Iscariot took a bribe to do unjustly to fulfill his desire, for an example. Um... You see this in kids too, to know that these spirits are real, like little babies, usually when they're young, they'll see something they want and they'll just take it. And if they see another child with it, they'll like just take it from them to see these are all teaching moments of helping understand the right way to go. If you don't have anything, continue in Testament room, chapter three, verse seven, please. And with all these, the spirit of sleep is joined, which is that of error and fantasy. So the spirits of error and fantasy join that eighth good spirit of sleep to lead us astray with fantasizing dreams of our desires in all the aforesaid spirits. How do these fantasies in our sleep and these other spirits in our lives affect us? Continue verse eight, please. And so perishes every young man, darkening his mind from the truth, and not understanding the law of Elohim, nor obeying the admonitions of his fathers that befell me also in my youth. Not understanding these spirits, we would operate in them in our youth, and it would become a norm for us. And along with that, we would take dreams of our fantasies that are really from the place these spirits of error have in us as something good or pleasurable to us, or to weigh us down in sorrow, all of which is darkening our minds from the truth to be able to understand the law and admissions of the righteous to make changes in our life. This helps understand a bit how dreams would lift up the unwise because the struggle with the spirits of error from a youth had already been darkening the mind to be able to understand what the fantasy dreams were about so the person lacked understanding in the law and truth to assess the dreams rightly and go about getting understanding of the dreams according to scripture, but instead casting them off or coming up with their own interpretation or turning unto false prophets and getting false interpretations.
Can you read Surat 34 and 1, please? The hopes of a man void of understanding are vain and false, and dreams lift up fools. Void of Allah Hayim's understanding would lead to false hopes of a dream that's a fantasy, and it would lift up a man trusting in the vain dreams. Continue, please. Whoso regardeth dreams is like him that catcheth at a shadow and followeth after the wind. The vision of dreams is the resemblance of one thing to another, even as the likeness of a face to a face. The dreams can just be showing the things we still struggle with or desire, as Natalie said, as a man's eye, so is his sleep, either in the law of Allah Hayyam or the works of Belier. But if we're void of understanding that Allah Hayyam is pointing out what we're actually struggling with or need to change, we'll take pleasure in the dream or get down about it. And it will lift us up in pride or guide to sorrow. And we would walk in that spirit of error and or fantasy that was at work in it instead of getting the interpretation from Allah Hayyam through his servants to be sure we are guided by counsel and take it cheerfully as Allah Hayyam is showing us what we need for our growth. Continue verse 6, please. If they be not sent from the Most High in thy visitation, set not thy heart upon them. Notice that dreams are visitations. So it can be Allah Hayyam visiting us to give instruction, or the revealing of the spirits of error and fantasy attempting to lead us astray. Continue, please. For dreams have deceived many, and they have failed that put their trust in them. This is why it's important to get the interpretations from Ahaya, Allah Hayyam, like we see in the testimonies, like they did in Genesis 40 and 8. Knowing error and fantasy is at work and sleep, don't put confidence in a dream or walk according to our own view of it, but go according to the testimonies to be sure we have Allah Hayyam's guidance and don't set any hope upon the dream unless there is an interpretation from Allah Hayyam. And don't cast the dream off just because it wasn't what we wanted to see or we don't understand it. Always inquire regarding it and allow Allah Hayyam to bring forth the interpretation. That stuff is important because in the process of growing, talking that we talked a bit earlier about the heightened sense of self, the false sense of self that we created. Allah Hayyam is interested in how he, he puts us in a position where he gives us the work that's good for us <laughs> to help us in that the dreams is showing stuff that we may not want people to see because of the perception we've given to people. And to have to go tell Allah Hayyam's servant the dream to get the interpretation, it helps us be in that place of humility, willing to be vulnerable for somebody else to see who we are. So Allah Hayyam, it's interesting how he makes sure we are going to humble ourselves to come to him one way or another. <laughs> and if we don't, we're going to sit there. Cause you don't get, he's telling you what's going on because he speaketh once, yea, twice in a dream. But if you don't want people to see who you are, <laughs> you're going to sit right there in it and be afflicted when you could just take the humble route. And because your intent is to get rid of the old man, it's not hard to go tell what happened because you just like, Hey, if this is what it is. I want to get this right. I want to learn from this. I want to get what I need out of this to grow out of this. You know, he's interesting. <laughs> it shows the intent. Cause if you're not willing to humble yourself to, to go and get the interpretation or to, um, or to tell the dream, then your intent is to conceal. deceptive and concealment from kindred and friends hopefully that helps you know, growth and understanding what's at work in the processes
Now, continuing on the spirits that are against us, there are nine leading spirits at work from our youth to darken our mind from the truth of our purpose to serve Allah Hayyam, to gain immortality and hindering our understanding of his law and the admonitions of our parents and the Lord. Yeah, fornication, the first, the second, insatiableness, the third, fighting, the fourth, obsequiousness and chicanery, fifth, pride, sixth, lying, the seventh, injustice, the eighth, error, and the ninth, fantasy. Fornication is first and catalyst for them all. Knowing the goal of them all is to darken us from the truth and understanding the law, the remedy, if you will, is simple. Testament of Reuben, chapter 3, verse 9, please. And now, my children, love the truth, and it will preserve you. Hear ye the words of Reuben, your father. Alhaim's word is truth. According to what Yache said in John 17 and 9, and Yache the word of Ahaya is the truth himself in John 14 and 6, according to what he said. And the law is the truth in Psalms 119, 142. So, all in all, the truth is every word that proceeds from Allah Hayyam. And that's what we have to love to overcome. Not just love in emotion, but love in cleaving unto it. All right? For it to become our perspective. Testament of Reuben 7 and 9, please. I adjure you by the Elohim of heaven to do truth each one to his neighbor and to entertain love each one for his brother. Love the truth of the word of the Lord. Then do the truth outlined in the word unto each other and entertain love in thought, word, and deed and inclination of soul as we operate and we will be delivered from fornication and of the spirits of error reference love is a boundary lesson for more edification or entertaining love in everything now know that these nine spirits at work to lead us astray fornication as we prior mentioned the first of them is behind it all as spiritual fornication in idolatry is the cause of all evil separating us from Allah Hayyam. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon 14, verse 12, and then verse 27, please? Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 12. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 27. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning the cause and the end of all evil. All right, so we see through scripture, cause of all evil, some spiritual fornication and idolatry. Now, how is spiritual fornication and idolatry the cause of all evil? Deuteronomy 30 and 17, please. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou would not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other Elohims and serve them. Fornication, the spirit of it, turns the heart away to draw us away so as not to hear the word of Elohim to worship and serve other deities by hearing their words to go away from the law. This is what we ought not to do. Deuteronomy 28 and 14, please. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other Elohims to serve them. Any deviation from the word, which is the truth, is going after other deities to serve them, because any deviation to the right or left from the truth of the words of Elohim is spiritual fornication getting our heart to turn away and be drawn away to other spirits to hear their words that assist us to go to the right or left from hearing the law of Allah Hayyam. So we can see why spiritual fornication and idolatry is the cause of all evil 
because idols literally lead away from the good that is outlined in the word of Allah Hayyam. Knowing fornication affects to cause all evil in idolatry, Reuben understood fornication brings us to idols, which causes us to do sin to help confirm what we are now understanding. Testament of Reuben chapter 4 verse 6, and then jump to 8 and 11, please. All right, Testament of Reuben chapter 4 verse 6. For a pit unto the soul is the sin of fornication, separating it from Allah and bringing it near to idols. Because it deceives the mind and understanding. That's how it turns the heart away, as we read in Deuteronomy, to end up going off the path of the law through idols, through deceiving the mind and understanding. Continue, please. And leadeth young men into haze before their time. Notice, knowing it deceives the mind and understanding, if we're hearing the law, or being spoken to about the commandments and we're struggling to like grasp it, or it's like a resistance there, know that some type of spiritual fornication is at work. Okay? Because the commandments are not supposed to be grievous to us. So we can be aware of what's going on in our warfare. Now, also, notice fornication is a pit. And once we fall into it, it takes control of the soul and brings us near to idols, separating us from Allah by deceiving the mind and understanding, so we can't see or think aright right to do what's right to Allah Hayyam. Once it deceives the mind, it takes away our understanding, because she, the spirit of fornication herself, doesn't have understanding. So once she's in control, we won't do right. It's going to be a big step to get locked in with purpose of our minds to overcome this spirit. Verse 8, please. But ye heard regarding Joseph, how he guarded himself from a woman, and purged his thoughts from all fornication, and found favor in the sight of Allah and men. For the Egyptian woman did many things unto him, and summoned magicians, and offered him love potions. But the purpose of his soul admitted no evil desire. We will touch more on evil desire when we get to that spirit. And its works through fornication in our eyes or perception. But for now, notice to purge all his thoughts from fornication was done by the purpose of his soul, not to admit any evil desire. And he didn't have a desire to do evil in his heart. So it couldn't enter into him. Continue, please. Therefore, the Allah of your fathers delivered him from every evil and hidden death. Because of his effort, Allah Hayyam delivered him. And because of his heart, Allah Hayyam saw he was pure of heart in his desire not to do evil or have any evil in him. Allah Hayyam delivered him. This ties right back and helps confirm what we understood in Hermas, that Allah Haim has to see us enduring afflictions, then he will deliver in his compassion. Continue, please. For fornication overcomes not your mind, neither can Belier overcome you. It's going to take purpose of soul not to admit any evil desire into our minds, correcting every thought from fornication, so that fornication can't overcome us for Belier to have us. And we also have to come out of any evil desire in our heart as well. And if we do these things with a wholehearted purpose of soul, Allah will deliver. This is one spirit that is really going to take work because our effort has to be all in to actually not admit any evil desires as Joseph did. Testament and Naphtali 2 and 6, please. Yeah, that's true. Please, go ahead. It's true, because if you have any evil thought or imagination or desire in your heart, fornication is going to lead you 
you may be able to fight or or prolong the process for a moment, but at the end of the day, fornication it's going to lead you. Uh, it's going to control you. So this is one of those spirits that it can't have no place for you to be able to overcome it. If you start making excuses or you start um, you start giving into it, saying, okay, well, I'm going to do it this one time, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to overcome fornication. Uh, and, and spiritual fornication in any matter is going to be difficult. So you really have to cleanse yourself and really be pure of heart and mind toward Alahayim to be able to not give place to it and to focus on Alahayim and what's right in his sight. But if you lose that focus and you start trying to find the place where you can still fulfill your desire, you're, you're not going to be able to overcome fornication, at least at that time. So um, definitely put forth the work and cleansing your vessel and cleansing your heart and your thoughts and your mind to, to being upright in the sight of Alahayim, where you start actually only loving that which is good in Alahayim's sight. Because if there's another way, you're going to struggle. I'm done, Kasim. Thank you. I'm slow down. Hastiness. Hastiness of spirit works with hatred and the devil. Fornication, all these spirits, they hate Alahayim, so we got to slow down. That's going to help a lot in being able to catch things and give yourself time to process things to actually see what you're endeavoring upon and where you're going. Okay. All right. Uh, the Testament of Nathali, chapter 2, verse 6. As a man's strength, so also is his work. And as his mind, so also is his skill. And as his purpose, so also is his achievement. And as his heart, so also is his mouth. And as his eye, so also is his sleep. And as his soul, so also is his word. Either in the law of the Lord or the works of Belier. So when we take on the endeavor to overcome the spirit of fornication, our secret faults will come to the light in the learning process, showing us where the works of Belier through fornication still have place. And if we can be honest, loving the truth, and confess the sins, and keep seeking after accountability and solutions with counsel, implementing laws to combat the works of Belier through fornication, we can come out of fornication and be delivered from Belier. When Elohim sees our purpose of soul and heart is wholehearted, and we are sincerely working not to admit any evil into our thoughts and making our hearts good before Elohim and putting in that work to get the evil out of it too. He will keep us from the devil and fornication as he did for Joseph, enduring every temptation patiently to see Alahim's way out. Reuben said, love the truth and do truth, entertain and love at all times. It's really going to take a love for the truth in the word of Alahim and applying it to do it in every instance to overcome because there will be instances that fornication will manifest itself and each time will be a trial and temptation. Now, let's touch on these things to see about how we're going to have trials in every instance, every action, every thought. Can you go back from the top of Naphtali 2 and 6, please? As a man's strength, so also is his work. So instances will come up showing our lack of strength to do the good works of Elohim because the works of fornication is in us. And we'll have to speak the truth about it and find out what truth we need to implement and do. And also pray for strength and reason with ourselves to grow in our purpose of soul to get stronger with each experience. And in some instances, those that are bigger struggles 
humble ourselves to say that we are weak in that area and fornication is stronger than our desire to do right in that area. So let us continue praying for deliverance from the struggle and strength to do what's right and not to put ourselves in that environment when possible, knowing it's not good for our souls. And will we have to be in that environment? Be very diligent, temperate, and quiet in our minds, not letting evil desires speak to cloud our judgment so we can know and hold fast the will of Allahayim to make it out from the temptation. And hopefully, one day, our faith and love for Allahayim will grow to where the desire isn't there anymore to tempt us for fornication to have place, Allahayim enabling us. Continue, please. Hey, yo, man, I'm at, um, hmm. The scripture says that uh, if we be patient, the Elohim will deliver. He'll make a way out. And if you just hold fast to Elohim and hold fast to what is the law on whatever it is that situation you may be in, if you hold fast to the law and be diligent and don't move, or make any any type of uh, decision, Allah will make a way out. But if you give yourself over, or you be hasty, or whatever the case is, then you're going to fall into whatever it is that you're being tempted with. Sometimes it's just better to just stay still and just wait. Thank you. No. And as his mind, so also is his skill. There will be mental lapses when fornication prevails and an evil desire enters in, leading us not to be skillful in keeping the law. We will have the opportunity to cleave to the truth in those instances and be honest with Allah about what happened, confessing our faults, and seek for what truth we need to do to grow from the experience, getting counsel as needed in areas where we see we keep giving in to the same types of thoughts or deeds. And if you don't have anything, continue, please. And that's his purpose. So also is his achievement. There will be instances where we will not achieve in doing right because our purpose of soul isn't strong enough or wholehearted, and that's a truth we will have to take accountability of and be honest about with Allah and take the time to reason to find whatever it takes to have a wholehearted purpose of soul to do truth and achieve a step forward to the goal of not permitting any evil desire into our minds. Continue, please. And as his heart, so also is his mouth. Interesting. We have to be sure not to let anything into our mind. And we also have to be sure not to let anything into our heart. And we can know where our heart is, how we respond to our lapses, to our shortcomings, and to our struggles. There will be instances where the evil of our heart will be shown in our speech. Another opportunity is there to love truth and confess with Allah and seek after counsel to know what to do in truth from the learning experiences. An example that if you find you're beating yourself up after you do wrong, if those are the words you're speaking, examine the heart. But if you're taking accountability, Okay, taking a moment to re to encourage the soul to reset your purpose, to remember your purpose. And then you can know where your heart is at in the effort. If you don't have anything, continue, please. Um, a lot of experiences and temptations actually show us where our heart is. Because how you go through that temptation or how you go through that experience and what may come forth from your mouth actually shows where your heart is. Um, for instance, if you're having difficulties with your spouse and your, 
spouse does something that you don't like, the way that you speak about your spouse afterwards shows where your heart is. So you actually get to see, man, like I need to examine myself. Why am I so angry with what they did to me? Because that anger already has a place in me and it's showing that anger in my heart. That's part of the reason why you may have even gotten into the situation. So it, the heart really does show through the mouth. Um, as his eye, so also is his sleep. If fornication is darkening our eyes to have the wrong view or outlook, there will be dreams showing us our shortcomings and where fornication still has sway in us. Those are also opportunities to wake up and bless Allah for showing where we are so we can see ourselves in truth and then seek counsel for an interpretation from Allah to know the instructions he's given to keep our soul from the pit that fornication is seeking to lead us to so that we can know what he wills for us to help us do truth or even understand the truth about ourselves and overcome. If you don't have anything, continue, please. As his soul, so also is his word, either in the law of the Lord or in the works of Belier. That's a simple dichotomy of every thought, inclination, action, and word. And there will always be an opportunity to see where we are in the faith by judging ourselves according to that division of light and dark. And when we see the dark, to be honest and take responsibility for our part and seek the truth of what we need to do to come out of it for truth and love's sake to be strengthened in our purpose to overcome. Testament of Reuben, chapter 4, verse 5, please. Therefore, my children, I say unto you, observe all things whatsoever I command you, and ye shall not sin. Loving the truth and doing truth in the law and fruits, entertaining love in everything, and being on guard, with purpose of soul to admit no evil into our mind or hearts can and will keep us from sinning. Just got to take each opportunity to get better with joy and temperance. The thing is, it takes time, patience, and humility to go through the process and get there as it even took Reuben seven years to overcome and Simeon two years. So many men have fallen to fornication and were unable to come out of it, either being given over to it, or in some cases, for others being unfit for the duration of the test or the process it, it takes to overcome, being unable to endure the trial to come out of it because it's not a quick fix. So they got comfortable in the areas they couldn't overcome easily. Continue, please, in verse 7. For well, many have fornication destroyed. Fornication was the root cause of the uncleanness and iniquity that brought about the flood. So it's not an understatement to say it has destroyed many. Continue, please. Because though a man be old or noble or rich or poor, he bringeth reproach upon himself with the sons of men in derision with Belier. It can affect anybody from any upbringing, any walk of life. It can affect us. All right. Now, we're going, we've talked about it a bit. There's more to discuss about fornication, but we're going to look at some examples of people overcoming the struggle and also seeing what it looks like when someone is in the struggle or overcome by the struggle. Let's start with an example of overcoming the struggle. 
touch back to Ruben four and eight, please. But ye heard regarding Joseph, how he guarded himself from a woman and purchased thoughts from all fornication. Guarded himself. He was very in tune with himself and what was going on within him. You Knowing fornication is in the nature and in the senses. And he purged his thoughts from all fornication, shunning the evil thought, cleaving to the law, really quieting his mind to have the law take precedence and not being haste to make sure no thought actually took root and be in temperance. Because you have instances where spirits, they, just like it happened with Eve, the serpent repeated the matter to incline her unto it, to incline her unto the lust, the draw, the anxiety that comes. So being able to keep temperance, even though evil thoughts come, and focus on getting to that place of being quiet in spirit it will help. We can see how Joseph, he really kept his focus on Allah Hayyim and on the words and admonitions of the righteous. If you look at Joseph Asenath, chapter 7, verse 6, please. But Joseph had Elohim always before his eyes and ever remembered the injunctions of his father. For Jacob often spake and admonished his sons, Joseph and all his sons, Keep yourselves, children, securely from a strange woman, so as not to have fellowship with her. For fellowship with her is ruin and destruction. We talked about the consistency um, the work is going to take. He said Joseph always had Allah before his eyes. There was no moment. He didn't give himself moments for himself or to put his own desires before his eyes. And he was consistent to remember what he was told to do. And Allah knows <clears throat> what we're in. He gives us laws to help keep us focused on him. He said, bind them upon your hands so we'll look at our hands and remember us for keeping the commandments. Put fringes upon our garments to remember to keep all the commandments. <laughs> we really have to be consistent in focusing on him and not look for times to take a break or get a lapse for ourselves because in that lapse, we'll get got. You have to find what works for you because you have to prove things in your life to see what's good for your soul and what's not good for your soul. You don't give that onto it. So you have to find what, when you do kind of need a moment to catch a breath, what helps you actually do that within maintaining righteousness. Like John, if you read Acts of the Apostles, it was a time he was sitting somewhere and just watching a bird and just laughing. And the person saw him and was amazed because, you know, it's John the Apostle. Like, what does he find entertaining in watching a bird? But John explained to him that if you have the strings of a harp or a guitar and it's always wound up, eventually it's going to break. Sometimes it has to be loosened. So you're going to need moments where you can just sit down and relax, but you have to also be sure it's... You're relaxing, doing an activity or in an environment where you actually can relax and not fall. You know. Well, that, that is actually good and right because think about Isakar. Isakar didn't understand rest. Isakar was working for Alahim, and we all see how zealous and righteous is a car the, the patriarch was um but he didn't understand taking a break until Allah showed him that rest was good and he actually rested and that was his time yeah
No wonder he didn't say. <laughs> So, not, that. not time to fulfill his desire. <laughs> Say this is me time. I'm gonna go do what I'm gonna do to fulfill my desire. Cause I feel like I've done enough. You know? hmm. The whole duty of man is to keep his commandments. So that should be the goal all the time. Even when you are taking a moment for yourself to just relax, the commandments shouldn't depart. And that will actually show where your heart is. I'm done, Kasi. You're right. Thank you. You're right. Hopefully that helps for our perspective and our, our reasoning and things to assess for ourselves, how we can get better to actually overcome. Now let's continue looking at how Joseph overcame Persian his thoughts and not given in to any desire, though the temptations were around him. Uh, Joseph chapter 9, Testament of Joseph chapter 9, verse 6, please. For when I was in her house, she was wont to bear arms and breasts and legs that I might lie with her. For she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned in order to beguile me. And the Lord guarded me for her devices. So the key part, yes, we read this verse before, but notice it was the Lord that guarded him from her devices. He understood where the help was coming from, and that lets you know who he was seeking the help from. So along with purging our thoughts, quieting our minds, our prayer, and who we look to for our deliverance is important. This is where the names come into play. Ahaya, Yache, Ruach Akwadoshi. These names have power. to defend and help us. We have a psalm that even says, the name of the Allah Hayyam of Jacob, defend thee. Okay. It makes a difference. So he was kept by not inclining his heart unto her, nor setting his eyes upon her. Remember, the eyes is where arises desire. So there are instances where we have to be mindful of where we're looking and what we're looking at and why we're looking at it. Can you look at Jasher 44 and 15, please? All right, keep your eyes to the ground. Yeah, <laughs> put your eyes down. <laughs> uh, Jasher 44 and 15. <laughs> at that time, while he was in his master's house, going in and out of the house and attending his master, Zelika, his master's wife, lifted up her eyes toward Joseph, and she looked at him. And behold, he was a youth, comely and well-favored. And she coveted his beauty in her heart. And her soul was fixed upon Joseph, and she enticed him day after day. And Zelika persuaded Joseph daily, but Joseph did not lift up his eyes to behold his master's wife. Here you get to see how... It can affect the negative effect it can have where she looked at him. And unfortunately, she was already struggling because the backstory to this is from before he had even got sold to Pontiferous, she had already desired to see him out of sin. So when she saw him, she just was getting to fulfill that desire. And now she's locked in on it. She was fixed upon him from that point. So if we're having a desire to look at people lustfully, it's going to affect us to where when we do look at somebody, we're going to lust after them and get fixed upon it. And in that coveting, it's going to fornication. And that lust of it is going to get us to act on it. And she was seeking to persuade him daily, trying to entice him. 
but you can see Joseph being aware and actually seeking to do what's right. He did not lift up his eyes to behold his master's wife. He understood what that would do, knowing the work that he's working on. So for brothers and sisters, be mindful of who you're looking at and what you're looking at them for. And be honest with ourselves if we know who we really are and the struggles we have and we have to put our eyes down, that's what we have to do to be able to keep the faith. There's nothing to be ashamed of because even you have John, the apostle, the Lord helped him out of his struggle until he got to the point where it was hateful for him to look upon a woman. And then Thomas, the apostle, he would literally walk around looking at the ground until it was something Allah Hayyam wanted him to do, just waiting on Allah Hayyam's will. And the precepts confirm this thing with the eyes. It's a righteous thing and great people in the faith have done it. You have Joseph. We know the blessing and the calling he had. Moses himself worked through overcoming fornication with the same understanding and awareness. Let's touch on Jasher 73. Moses, he had um just for a backstory so you can know the environment he was in. He had been made king of Ethiopia and he had been given the wife of the former king who had died. So there's a queen, you know, he has everything before him. But the same way Joseph always had Allah Hayyam before him, Moses was the same, remembering the admonitions given, and he wouldn't look upon her to keep himself from falling. Can you read Jasher 73 and 32, please? And Moses feared Ahiah Allah Hayyam of his fathers, so that he came not to her, nor did he turn his eyes to her. For Moses remembered how Abraham had made his servant Eleazar swear, saying unto him, Thou shalt not take a woman from the daughters of Canaan for my son Isaac. Also what Isaac did when Jacob had fled from his brother, when he commanded him, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, nor make alliance with any of the children of Ham. For Ahiah or Elohim gave Ham, the son of Noah, and his children, and all his seeds, as slaves to the children of Shem, and to the children of Japheth, and unto their seed after them for slaves forever. Therefore Moses turned not his heart nor his eyes to the wife of Kikikanis, all the days that he reigned over Cush. So you can see, Moses didn't turn his heart, first and foremost, so he made sure the desire wasn't in his heart. And also... He didn't put his eyes on to her. He was mindful not to give the spirit of fornication any place, whether in heart or in his outlook. All right? So you can see that people have done it and there are ways to do it, to overcome fornication and the spirit of it altogether. At another time, we're going to actually get into a bunch of remedies and scriptures about fornication itself. But for now we're just looking at Let's see Joseph's testimony after his trial and what he went through, please. In Joseph chapter 6, Testament of Joseph chapter 6, verse 7. But that thou mayest learn that the wickedness of the unholy hath no power over them that worship Allah with chastity. Okay. Chastity is from the Greek G1467 to exercise self restraint in diet and chastity to be contained be temperate so the big thing we talked about mm, whichever lesson it was about the holy leader mind about being temperate that temperance and that restraint to keep the quietness of mind the silence so we can hear the will of Allah Hayyam. Praying to Allah Hayyam to know his will and being patient for a way out. Not being hasty in thought or action. As Isaac we even said, if the instance requires just to sit down or stand still right where we're at, we have to do what we have to do to be able to actually worship Allah Hayyam with chastity. 
And if we do that, wickedness or the unholy, whether a literal person or one of those unholy spirits, they don't have power over that. They need us in intemperance. Jealousy herself, we'll get to talking about that. Jealousy herself, she takes away men's soberness, sobriety, and moderation. She knows what she's doing because she needs to get us out of that temperance and soberness of mind so that we'll fall into the lust of fornication where she dwells. So understand temperance, chastity, self-restraint in everything. It really will help. It's an interesting thing. Um, dealing with any of these spirits, it's just like when you first get a job, you first get a job and you don't know much about the job. You go in there, you're, you're seeking how to do things. You're going through training so that you can understand what it is that you're doing or what it is that you're up against. And that's exactly how it is for all of these spirits. You have to first go into training to understand what you're up against. And after you understand it, it gets easier. The job is always hard when you first start because you don't understand it. But when you start understanding it, then it starts getting easier because you start understanding, okay, that's what this is. That's what's going on here. I understand where it's trying to get me here. I understand once you start going through the ins and outs and you start gaining that experience, it gets easier. And that's how it is. It's the same thing here in the gospel, here in this walk, in this journey. The more you understand, the more experience you have, the more understanding you have, it makes it easier to stand away from things or to cleave onto things in a good sense. So you grow. That's what growing is. Growing is learning. And the more you learn, the more you grow. The stronger you become in your faith and in your walk. Man. So we got a glory and kind of all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Because it's always an opportunity to learn. Right. And Paul said we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works with patience. It's going to help us perfect our patience. And then that patience, experience, and experience hope. So we need the experiences to build up our hope. Is that I have the patience to go through the experience. <laughs> yeah. Continue verse 9 and 3, please. And if a man liveth in chastity and desireth also glory, and the Most High knoweth that it is expedient for him, he bestoweth this also upon me. What you make of that statement? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't reading it to break it down. <laughs> I was reading it to read it for you. <laughs> Um, if a man live in chastity, which is self-restraint, and desireth also glory, and the Most High knoweth that it is expedient for him, he bestoweth this also upon me. All right. Where am I at? Where, where are we jumping in at? Testament of Joseph. Oh, okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. I got to read it in this proper context. Okay. 
All right, the Testament of Joseph, chapter 9, verse 2. For Elohim loveth him, who in a den of wickedness combines fasting with chastity, rather than the man who in king's chambers combines luxury with license. And if a man liveth in chastity, so if that man chooses to put on chastity, and desireth also glory, the Most High knoweth that it is expedient for him. So if it's expedient for that man, then it's going to it's gonna happen. Allah is going to give it to him because he's already working that which is good. So Allah can trust him to give him more, knowing that he's going to do what's right with what Allah gives him. Allah <laughs> Gotta do right first, <laughs> and that's the case with Joseph. It said, "If a if a man liveth in chastity, and desireth also glory, and the Most High knoweth that it's expedient for him, he bestoweth this also upon me." That's exactly what he did for Joseph. Mm -hmm. Moses too, right? For Abraham and Jacob too, and there for a few mm -hmm. folks. <laughs> right. All right. Continue chapter ten, verse one. When you ready, thank you. Yep. You see, therefore, my children, how great things patience worketh, and prayer with fasting. You really do see. It worketh when in that patience working to overcome whatever affliction or, or what we will call experiences Allah is having us go through. If we do that with patience, prayer, with fasting, Allah is going to deliver us and he's going to give us what's good for us, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Now, the fasting part, let's understand what he's referring to. Hermes Parable 5, chapter 1, verse 4, please. But fast thou unto Allah such a fast as this. Do no wickedness in thy life, and serve the Lord with a pure heart. Observe his commandments, and walk in his ordinances. And let no evil desire rise up in thy heart, but believe Allah Then if thou shalt do these things, and fear him, and control thyself from every evil deed, thou shalt live unto Allah. And if thou do these things, thou shalt accomplish a great fast and one acceptable to Allah. That's what's needed to be delivered. We have to pray, but we also have to actually control ourselves from every evil deed. And do no wickedness in our life and serve the Lord with a pure heart, observing his commandments and walking in his ordinance and letting no evil desire rise up in our heart so that we can actually be delivered just as Joseph didn't allow any evil desire because of his purpose of soul. Patience, working, praying, and controlling ourselves from every evil and allowing any evil to enter into us we're going to live on Talahayim and we're going to be delivered from the spirit of fornication and her children. Continue, if you will. So ye too, if ye follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer, with fasting and humility of heart, the Lord would dwell among you because he loveth chastity. And wheresoever the Most High dwelleth, even though envy or slavery or slander befalleth a man, the Lord who dwelleth in him for the sake of his chastity not only delivereth him from evil, but also exalteth him even as me. For in every way the man is lifted up, whether in deed or in word or in thought. Notice the exaltation Joseph is referring to is in how he was operating in righteousness. Allah exalted him in, in word, in deed, and in thought. 
to do us right in every respect when he overcame. Okay. So let's follow after chastity, constraining ourselves, restraining ourselves in temperance and purity with patience and prayer, being patient, long suffering, understanding and continuing in prayer with fasting and humility of heart, which understand that humility of heart type of fast is to actually keep ourselves from all evil. And Allah will actually dwell among us and he will deliver us. Okay. So that's a touching on someone overcoming the struggle and understanding the things it takes to overcome the struggle. Now, we're going to get into an example of someone being overcome with the struggle of fornication. Sackwell, when you're ready, can you start in the Testament of Joseph, chapter 14, verse 4, please? Well, she wished to see me out of a desire of sin, but I was ignorant concerning all these things. So, looking at this lady, she was already struggling with the spirit of fornication. You can see it from her desire was to see if somebody out of sin. All right. Her desire was out of lust, so her actions, not a fornication, the spirit of it has place. Her actions are actually going to be in, remember that lying operates in perdition and jealousy with concealments from kindred and friends. She's going to start operating with that, her hidden pretense from that point forward being given to the spirit of fornication, even when in a guise of doing something good. So we can understand, it's interesting, we talked about it earlier, how uh, I had a good intent, but to know if an evil spirit is there, that good intent is going to turn to something bad. And here, this woman, because of her struggle with fornication, she's doing things that's going to seem good, but really, we know already from the scriptures that it was an evil intent and an evil spirit at work in what she was actually doing. So jumping into the story, this is uh, Zelica, the wife of Pontiferous. Uh, we're jumping in to see, this is before Joseph had ever came to their house. This is when he was a slave for the uh, Ishmaelites and the Midianites, or the Arabs, if you will. Let's read from chapter 12, verse 1, please. We already know her desire. All right, so let's see how it goes. When the Testament of Joseph, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And about that time, the Miphian woman, the wife of Pentapherus, came down in the chariot with great pomp because she had heard from her eunuchs concerning me. And she told her husband that the merchant had become rich by means of a young Hebrew. And they say that he had assuredly been stolen out of the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, render justice unto him. And take away the youth from thy house. So shall the Elohim of the Hebrews bless thee. For grace from heaven is upon him. Now notice all this is said, but her intent is evil. For one, she came down with great pomp. She wouldn't abide in her house. So you can see the spirit of fornication at work. Because she heard about a man that she wanted to see about. Remember, she wanted to see him out of a desire of sin. And the words she spake, it sounded good, but it was really to fulfill her desire. We're just going through this to see how the spirit of fornication can lead a person to be in those spirits of error and other spirits that we've been talking about. Let's continue chapter 13, verse 1, please. Don't forget that it was her eunuchs that came and told her. Talk to me. I see what you're saying, but talk to me. It said, um, this is the reason she went, because of what she heard from her eunuchs. So you don't know what they were dealing in either. Because they may have understood her and went and told her, knowing that she may be interested. Mm -hmm. So 
You see how it goes, because as soon as once she heard from the eunuch, she hopped out and and went on about her way. Yes, because there's another part in Jasher that when her all her friends had came around, no action was wrong. When she told him it was because she wanted to sleep with Joseph, she was like, I mean, the friends were like, he's your slave. Just tell him to do it. So you can see that was the culture. Like, you got authority over him. Just tell him what you want and do what you want to do. So, and you see the environment that was going on. Speaking of we, the spirit of fornication, like, Look at the environment they're in, where things are done behind the scenes. The husband, he's being manipulated, but unfortunately, he's an idolater too. So he's in fornication as well, being led by his wife. And she, she's able to manipulate him and get him to do what she wants him to do. Mm -hmm. Jumping into chapter 13, verse 1, please. And Pentapherus was persuaded by her words and commanded the merchant to be brought and said unto him, What is this that I hear concerning thee, that thou stillest persons out of the land of Canaan and sellest them for slaves? Let's jump down to um, where he was speaking to the Arabs and now he got Joseph to come before him and he's questioning Joseph. Continue please in verse 8. And he said, How didst thou become their slave? And I said, They bought me out of the land of Canaan. And he said unto me, Truly thou liest. And straightway he commanded me to be stripped down and beaten. Now the Memphian woman was looking through a window at me while I was being beaten, for a house was near. And she sent unto him, saying, Thy judgment is unjust. For thou doest punish a free man who hath been stolen, as though he were a transgressor. And when I made no change in my statement, though I was beaten, he ordered me to be imprisoned until he said, The owner of the boy shall come. And the woman said unto her husband, Wherefore doest thou detain the captive and well-born lad in bonds, who ought rather to be set at liberty? and be waited upon, for she wished to see me out of a desire of sin, but I was ignorant concerning all these things. And he said to her, It is not the custom of the Egyptians to take that which belongeth to others before proof is given. This therefore he said concerning the merchant, but as for the lad, he must be imprisoned. So you see, Everything she's going for, she's got that desire she's trying to fulfill. Now, she's not letting go of it. When a person is given to a desire, unfortunately, that spirit is still at work to get that um, work fulfilled. Because in um, Acts of Thomas 75, we're going to talk about it at some point in this discussion, but to mention it now, Demons are strengthened. Evil spirits are strengthened by the works they get us to commit. The devil had said in Acts of Thomas 75 that he's refreshed by murders, adulteries, and sacrifices upon wine on altars. So to understand why, why does it, our evil desire, we let it in and it just keeps on because they need to fulfill that work to strengthen themselves and their position in us. Okay. So a woman still looking for a way to fulfill her desire. She finds out Joseph's being sold. Let's jump to see how, what she does. Okay. Chapter 16, verse 1, please. Very specifically, fornication. Um, it, you don't let up the desire if fornication overtakes you. Thanks. Clarity. Oh. Now the Miphian woman said to her husband, by the youth. For I hear, says she, that they are selling him. And straightway she sent a eunuch to the Ishmaelites and asked them to sell me. But since the eunuch would not agree to buy me at their price, he returned, having made trial of them. And he made known to my mistress that they asked a large price for their slave. And she sent another eunuch, saying, 
even though they demand to mean us, give them and do not spare the gold. Only buy the boy and bring him to me. So notice, she found opportunity for endeavor. She told him what she wanted, and she straightway sent him to do it. And she's intent on fulfilling that endeavor, no matter the cost, get it done. Okay. And let's continue to see what happens. He's been bought. You notice she hadn't seen him yet. She still had the desire to see him. Now let's see. He's been bought. He's at their house now. Let's see how this goes. Jasper chapter 44, verse 14, please. And Joseph was 18 years old, a youth with beautiful eyes and, and of comely appearance. And like unto him was not in the whole land of Egypt. At that time, while he was in his master's house, going in and out of the house and attending his master, Zilica, his master's wife, lifted up her eyes toward Joseph, and she looked at him. And behold, he was a youth comely and well favored, and she coveted his beauty in her heart. And her soul was fixed upon Joseph, and she enticed him day after day. And Zelica persuaded Joseph daily, but Joseph did not lift up his eyes to behold his master's wife. You see, prior desire, she had the opportunity to finally fulfill and see what she wanted to see. And she was given over to it. As we talked about, if we have that desire to look at people lustfully, when the opportunity rises, that's what we're going to do, as we see in her case. And then from then on, she's fixed upon it. Everything she's doing is with that desire and intent in mind. We talked about already how she would dress. She would bare her arms, her breasts, her legs, in hopes that he would look at it and be enticed to fulfill her desire. And likewise, if we're going through this, a man can do these same things, okay? Let's continue chapter 44, verse 17, to see how she operated in the spirit of fornication to get a glimpse of how it can be at work in different ways. When you're ready, please. And Zelika said unto him, How goodly are thy appearance and form! Truly I have looked at all the slaves, and have not seen so beautiful a slave as thou art. And Joseph said unto her, Surely, he who created me in my mother's womb created all mankind. And she said unto him, How beautiful are thy eyes, with which thou hast dazzled all the inhabitants of Egypt, men and women. And he said unto her, How beautiful they are, while we are alive. But shouldest thou behold them in the grave, surely thou wouldest move away from them. And she said unto him, how beautiful and pleasing are all thy words. Take now, I pray thee, the harp which is in the house, and play with thy hands, and let us hear thy words. And he said unto her, How beautiful and pleasing are my words when I speak the praise of my Elohim and his glory. And she said unto him, How very beautiful is the hair of thy head. Behold the golden comb which is in the house. Take it, I pray thee, and curl the hair of thy head. And he said unto her, How long wilt thou speak these words? Cease to utter these words to me, and rise and attend to thy domestic affairs. And she said unto him, There is no one in my house, and there is nothing to attend to but to thy words and to thy wish. Yet notwithstanding, all this she could not bring Joseph unto her, neither did he place his eye upon her, but directed his eyes below to the ground. And Zelica desired Joseph in her heart that he should lie with her. And at the time that Joseph was sitting in the house doing his work, Zelica came and sat before him, and she enticed him daily with her discourse to lie with her, or even to look at her. But Joseph would not hearken to her. 
Notice, you remember the spirit of obsequiousness and chicanery? One of the synonyms was, I think it was fawning, or was a lot of flattery. You can see how she's talking to him, just trying to get, and then you see how she's talking to him in that spirit, right? Then also remember, wrath uses provocation by a word. So when someone praises you, don't be moved to delight. So she was, this is the spirit of fornication because fornication knows all that she's mother of all evils. We're going to touch on that precept at some point. So she knows what all her children's need <laughs> to get their place in us. Whatever it takes. Okay. Fawn him, flatter him a bit. See if that gets him to be delighted so we can have place. But you see how he responds. He's focused on Allah Hayim. As he said, Allah Hayim was before his eyes at all times. Okay, she's calling him attractive. Allah Hayim made me just like any man. She's comping his appearance. Surely, I'm going to die just like any man. He was mindful of what was going on. Attentive to the warfare he was in. Let's see what the spirits were doing. It was all just to get him to at least entertain it in his thoughts. Because mm -hmm. once, his, once his mind would have been upon it, his eyes would have went to it. Same thing that happened with Eve. After the serpent convinced her of what he said, then she looked at the fruit to see that it was desirable and good for food. It took place. So if we're catching ourselves, we see our eyes are going a direction. Know that that thought is taking place if our eyes is taking heed unto it. Because our mind, the mind is where it starts. Remember, the holy leader mind is actually supposed to be using the senses as a medium. The senses is supposed to serve the purpose of fulfilling the law. But if fornication takes control of the mind, the senses are going to start to operate for fornication. It has control. So, know it and do what you got to do. Shut your eyes if you got to and regroup. Do what you have to do. And knowing the spirit of fornication operates in the narcissistic spirits, then comes the anger. As we're going to see here, now she starts to threaten to try to get what she wants. Are you going to... Um correlated with that you gotta speak about the love bombing that just happened <laughs> i didn't think about it but you're right she definitely <laughs> love bombed she tried to be who she thought he wanted to see who he wanted give him all the compliments and talk, tell him everything he wants to hear you can touch on it if you will no nah, it's simple enough okay she was deceitful and talking about the spirit of lying and concealment, she was concealing her true self, trying to be somebody who she thought he wanted to see, and giving him an outward perception that might entice him. Right. This is real life, folks. This happens. Yes, it is. All the time. This is that relationship where, after a while, that person isn't who they were when you first met them. That's usually how almost all relationships are nowadays. Because if you get into a marriage with a person and then you feel like you're with a different person, it's the same thing. Yes, sir. So we can understand why we're going to get into discussing the process and what we need to do to take our time. For now, do nothing without inquiry. Have counsel before every action. Pray to Allah and wait for an answer. You know. Every enterprise. Yes. As Paul said in the scripture, you are thou loose from a wife, seek not a wife. All right. If you happen to things didn't work out, whatever Allah purpose, don't go trying to get into something else. Focus on Allah. And if you're with somebody that's pleased to dwell with you, 
focus on Allah Hayim and what she can do well to edify that person in Allah Hayim. Now let's see, we got the love bombing. Now let's see the real person. Jasha 44 and 24, please. And she said unto him, If thou would not do according to my words, I would chastise thee with the punishment of death, and put an iron yoke upon thee. And Joseph said unto her, Surely Allah who created man looseth the fetters of prisoners, and it is he who will deliver me from thy prison and from thy judgment. And when she could not prevail over him to persuade him, her soul being still fixed upon him, a desire threw her into a grievous sickness. You can see how fornication leads to health complications too. Unfulfilled desires. And sees Joseph, he really kept his mind on Allah Hayyam. To take the time and remember the testimonies. And Allah Hayyam delivers out of prison too, so he's going to deliver me. He didn't give in to the anxiety of, oh man, man, she's going to get me locked up. What do I do? I said, Allah, I am a deliverer. His mind was set. It wasn't a hard thing to think about. And that's something for us. If we're not there, that's something for us to get to. Because that's how the righteous operated. You had, um, we laughed about it the other day, Meshach and Abednego, when the king threatened them with death to worship his idols. They said, <laughs> we're not doing it. And even if Allah Hayyam don't deliver us, know that we're not doing it. <laughs> the same with Sarah in the Apocrypha. When them two men were telling her to sleep with them or else they're going to get her killed, she put herself in Allah Hayyam's hands. Like, no, nah, I'd rather fall in Allah Hayyam's hands. And we have to get to where, no matter how long that takes, how long we have to sit there to get to that place where we're on Allah Hayyam's side and we're putting ourselves in his hands. That's what we have to do in our trials. As it, it's going to be hard at first, exactly what I mentioned. It's something new. There's a new job that we're endeavoring on. There's a new vocation when, when we are called. But eventually it's going to become easy. And I also understand that these spirits like this, everything is they're trying to provoke you by a word. They want to get you in some type of emotion where then you're you're not focused on Allah Hayyam anymore. Because you can't be emotional and focus on Allah Hayyam at the same time. So if she will, she wanted to provoke him by a word, and if she would have got a reaction out of him, um a reaction that showed that he was in fear or that he was um, any type of fearful reaction or, or anger, any type of evil spirit reaction, then she would have had dominion over him. This is why it's so important for us to keep our eyes on Allah Hayyam and not to veer off on the left hand or to the right, nor to be um, vexed by anything so that we can actually stay temperate and chast doing what's right in the will of Allah Hayyam and keeping our focus on that, no matter what's going on around us or no matter what anyone may say to us. Because even in the example that Brother Kasso just gave uh, when it came to um, Sarah, those men were trying to, they pretty much were trying to bluff her. Like, we're going to do this if you don't do this to try to get her in fear. But it's, it's, it's just trying to get you into an emotion where you fall off of focusing on Allah Hayyam. So this is why we stress being temperate, not give, giving yourself over to an emotion, being grounded, standing upon the rock of Allah Hayyam and not being moved no matter how a situation may seem or what a person may say, keeping your eyes and your heart on Allah because that's the only thing that's going to deliver you.
because if you fall into any other spirit, then the one that is operating more in the evil spirit is going to have dominion over you. And you see, Joseph didn't give himself unto any evil spirit. Therefore, none of them could have dominion over him. And none of the people could have dominion over him. So this is why we have to be encouraged and mindful and and focused on doing what's right in the sight of Elohim always. And not being fearful of what a man or a woman can do to us. Because all things are in Elohim's hands. It's big too in another aspect of staying out of our emotions notice when she didn't get what she wanted she went deep into her feelings and for us that's a sign to know because notice she's in the spirit of fornication so she's operating according to it so if we see something doesn't go the way we thought it should go or wanted it to go and we get in our feelings that's letting us know that's a work of fornication because Allah Hayyam, we're supposed to be looking for his will in everything, not the way how we want something to go. And then how it works out, even if it doesn't allegedly go well, it actually went according as Allah Hayyam wanted it to. So we receive it as good from him. So there's no need, if we believe it's good from Allah Hayyam, getting down about it doesn't actually exemplify that. That's actually showing the works of fornication. Okay. We actually we should be joyful. All right. I gained something. I learned something. It went as I wanted it. Okay. Praise him for it. And that actually refreshes us because Acts of Thomas 75 talks about how we're refreshed by prayers, good works, and thanksgiving. So in everything, it's actually an admonition. In everything, give thanks. Okay. And if you find you're in your feelings, we have admonitions for that. Go sit down upon your bed and commune with your own heart and get to the right place. Get back on track. Okay. That's the reality. This is a journey and it is a process. Even Joseph, when he would get away from her, he was crying, praying out of him. It was a fight. It wasn't just a cakewalk, okay? Let's see some more of how fornication can lead a person to just do a lot trying to fulfill what it is we want. And again, this is for our learning and to understand how having any desire contrary to Allah can lead us in different ways. Okay. Joseph, Testament, Joseph chapter three, verse one, whenever you're ready, please. How often did the Egyptian woman threaten me with death? How often did she give me over to punishment and then call me back and threaten me? And when I was unwilling to company with her, she said to me, Thou shalt be master of me, and all that is in my house, if thou wilt give thyself unto me, and thou shalt be as our master. But I remember the words of my father, and going into my chamber, I wept and prayed unto the Lord. And I fasted in those seven years. And I appeared to the Egyptians as one living delicately. For they that fast for Elohim's sake receive beauty of face. And if my master were away from home, I drank no wine. Nor for three days did I take my food. But I gave it to the poor and sick. And I sought the Lord early, and I wept for the Egyptian woman of Memphis. For very unceasingly did she trouble me. For also at night did she come to me under pretense of visiting me. And because she had no male child, she pretended to regard me as a son. 
And so I prayed to the Lord and she bare a male child. And for a time, she embraced me as a son and I knew it not. But later she sought to draw me into fornication. And when I perceived it, I saw it unto death. And when she had gone out, I came to myself and lamented for her many days, because I recognized her gal and her deceit. And I declared unto her the words of the Most High, if happily she would turn from her evil lust. Often, therefore, did she flatter me with words as a holy man, and guilefully in her talk praises of my chastity before her husband, while desiring to ensnare me when we're alone. For she lauded me openly as chaste, and in secret she said unto me, Fear not my husband, for he is persuaded concerning thy chastity. For even should one tell him concerning us, he would not believe. Owing to all these things, I lay upon the ground, and besought Allah that the Lord would deliver me from her deceit. And when she had prevailed nothing thereby, she came again to me under the plea of instruction, that she might learn the word of Allah And she said unto me, If thou willest that I should leave my idols, lie with me. And I will persuade my husband to depart from his idols, and we will walk in the law of the Lord. And I said unto her, The Lord willeth not that those who reverence him should be in uncleanness, nor do if he take pleasure in them that commit adultery, but in those that approach him with a pure heart and undefiled lips. And she held her peace, longing to accomplish her evil desire. And I gave myself yet more to fasting and prayer, that the Lord might deliver me from her. And again, at another time, she said unto me, If thou would not commit adultery, I would kill my husband by poison, and take thee to be my husband. I therefore, when I heard this, rent my garments and said unto her, Woman, reverence Allah am, and do not this evil deed at least thou be destroyed. For know indeed that I will declare this thy device unto all men. And she therefore, being afraid, besought that I would not declare this device. And she departed, soothing me with gifts, and sending to me every delight of the sons of men. And afterwards she sent me food mingled with enchantments. And when a eunuch who brought it came, I looked up, and behold, a terrible man giving me with the dish a sword, and I perceived that her scheme was to beguile me. And when he had gone out, I wept, nor did I taste that or any other of her food. So then after one day she came to me and observed the food and said unto me, why is it that thou hast not eaten of the food? And I said unto her, It is because thou hast filled it with deadly enchantments. And how saidest thou, I come not near to idols, but to the Lord alone? Now therefore know that the Elohim of my father hath revealed unto me by his angel thy wickedness, and I have kept it to convict thee, if haply thou mayest see and repent. But that thou mayest learn that the wickedness of the unholy hath no power over them that worship Allah with chastity. Behold, I will take of it and eat before thee. And having so said, I prayed thus, the Allah of my fathers and the angel of Abraham be with me and ate. And when she saw this, she fell upon her face at my feet weeping. And I raised her up and admonished her. And she promised to do this iniquity no more, for her heart was set upon evil. And she looked around how to ensnare me, 
and sighing deeply, she became downcast, though she was not sick. And when her husband saw her, he said unto her, Why is thy countenance fallen? And she said unto him, I have a pain at my heart, and the groaning of my spirit oppressed me. And he comforted her, who was not sick. Then accordingly, seizing an opportunity, she rushed unto me while her husband was yet without, and said unto me, I will hang myself, or cast myself over a cliff, and thou wilt not lie with me. And when I saw the spirit of Belia was troubling her, I prayed unto the Lord, and said unto her, Why, wretched woman, art thou troubled and disturbed, blinded through sins? Remember that if thou kill thyself, asked Tiho, the maid wife of thy husband, thy rival, will beat thy children, and thou wilt destroy thy memorial from off the earth. And she said unto me, Lo, that thou lovest me, let this suffice me. Only strive for my life and my children, and I expect that I shall enjoy my desire also. But she knew not that because of my master I spoke thus, and not because of her. For if a man hath fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it, even as she, whatever good he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with a view to his wicked desire. There's a lot that transpired here. Okay. There's a lot you can get understanding how the spirit of fornication does. Lord, I we're going to touch on some things here. All right, let's get into this here. Fornication in spirit is mean. So you see how often did the Egyptian woman threaten me with death? So you know in the scriptures it says forbear threatening. When we see in the spirit of fornication, we'll be threatening for the sake of our desires or out of frustration because we're not getting what we want. And then using not only threats, but when also giving someone over to a punishment, then call them back and continuing with it. Also, you see the deceit in that she was trying to find anything just to fulfill her desire. She went from threatening to then offering, bribing, essentially, to say, if you do this, you'll be master over me and all my house. When she had a husband that was actually master of the house, so that gives you insight as to what their relationship was like. That she didn't have that respect for him as her husband. She felt she could manipulate to get her husband to do anything she wanted him to do. And also, we see in Joseph again having Elohim before him remembering the words of his father and also going into so giving himself unto prayer as we talked about it wasn't that it was just an easy thing praying even with tears he really wanted to overcome what was in front of him and also as we talked about earlier it takes time he said he fasted those seven years. It was a work to get to the place where he was really grounded in it. But his fast was in a fast of righteousness. And we see Elohim in that righteous fast. Elohim also helped his health. So the spirit of um, 
insatiableness in the belly, that greed didn't have place in him. So he was doing things temperately, admitted no evil desire, and it helped him in his health as well. And he also took the time to be mindful of his environment. For example, if he knew his master was at home, he wouldn't drink because he understood fornication actually works and uses wine as a minister. So that wouldn't help him, nor the environment he's in. So that's for us to understand. Prove what's good for us in our life and what's not good for us and don't give that bad thing unto it or don't put ourselves in that environment that we know is bad for us. Because if we put ourselves in it, it's fornication that's leading us to do that, to give us an excuse to fulfill a desire. Also, this was big, verse 6. He said, And I sought the Lord early, and I wept for the Egyptian woman of Memphis. The spirit of fornication in Testament of Judah, it teaches that fornication doesn't suffer one to have compassion on their neighbor. Though this woman was doing what she was doing, Joseph he didn't go out of having compassion for a woman in the midst of her struggle with fornication. Remember, he saw that she struggled with an evil desire. He saw that fornication was on her. So he was long-suffering and understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's important to do. If we see someone struggling with the spirit of fornication, the works of it, which is essentially if someone struggling with any evil spirit, it's the spiritual fornication at work because it takes spiritual fornication to be in a struggle. Or, and or if we see it in ourselves, don't get out of the compassion or the mercy for the person or ourselves. Because from Judah, we're going to talk about at some point that if we don't have compassion on someone's struggle, this, those spirits, fornication and jealousy, they're going to array themselves against us and get us to fall. So if Joseph wouldn't uh, have compassion and even pray and weep even for her and her struggle, that would have gave fornication a place to enter and get him. So you see how being humble in everything, as Allah wants us to be humble in every action, even in how we view someone that's trying to get us to do evil or doing evil against us to get us to fall or doing something that's not good, our humble reaction has to be in that mercy and compassion for them in their struggle, no matter what they're doing. else is in here we have verse 7 now if you wonder another thing with the spirit of fornication fornication uses the guise of acting like your loved one and it's really just an endeavor to entice us as the woman she regarded him as a son but it was just a pretense to be around him and to hopefully get him to come into her. So you may have with a brother or sister that's awfully friendly, but be mindful of what the real intent is. Like Sarak said, you gotta know what they have need of. It may not be the necessarily the desire to sleep with you but it may be something else that they're trying to fulfill or something else they're trying to get out of you yes sir well, scripture is talking about prove a friend know what a man what you reference or know what a man have need of 
as I say, spirit of fornication, it uses lying and deceit. So as she's deceitfully concealing what her real desire is, trying to get something out of him, any person can be in that struggle of fornication, trying to gain or get something out of you. And notice, Joseph Alahayan revealed what was going on to him. So for us, if we keep that simplicity of really just being focused on what's right to Allah and doing right according to Allah and everything, he'll show us what's going on to let us know, you know, what we're doing or where or what that person is endeavoring and seeking after. Excuse me. What else we got? There's another thing fornication can do where, with, again, Zach will mention how these spirits just seek to entice us with words, to provoke us, where she started to flatter him as being a holy man. That's another means of trying to talk about how good you are, especially in the presence of others, to gain you and also to beguile others about you. You have to be mindful of that too. Unfortunately, someone, she's praising him in the presence of her husband out of a secret desire. And you have to be mindful of the spirit of fornication that it's, uh, they'll act like he has love for you, but there's a not really love there. It just wants something out of you. Big thing, notice she was one way in front of her husband, but then in secret she was trying to get Joseph to do something else. Spirit of fornication is different. It's a different person behind closed doors. So you see somebody that two-faced, or they have two versions of themselves or different versions of themselves depending on who they're talking to, that person is a struggle with fornication. The spirit of it. That's why we, in our calling, we are working to be one person at all times, no matter what is going on, no matter where we are, no matter who we're around, but we're that one person seeking after the will of Allah and everything. Hmm. Anything else you had, Zach? Well, there's a whole lot here for you. Um, the flattering with gifts. That one too. Um, a lot of times they'll flatter you with gifts when a person is struggling with fornication to blind you. It's pretty much just to kind of like fill your heart so that you will give them what they want. Or and sometimes it means to guilt trip you. Yeah into getting what they want. Yeah. All in all, the spirit of fornication has no has no um no limits to fulfilling the desire. That puts it in a nutshell. Cause she's mother of all evil, so any spirit, any work will get used to fulfill a desire. Right. I think that sums it up good. To know. Spirit of fornication is no joke. It really isn't. The common denominator is what they're going for. That's how you know. <laughs> yeah. And for us, we... You know, hopefully this helps in saying, like, we really need to take the time to understand ourselves and see what are we really going for. 
you know, what is our true heart's desire and where we're headed, you know? Yeah. Who are we when we're outside of the house as opposed to inside of the house? Or when we're with people that knows us and doesn't know us, like, really slowing down and taking that time to see ourselves. Now, seeing fornication is the culprit behind the spiritual struggles that are against us from our youth and in our life altogether. It's an important spirit to discuss and it truly wasn't made for us, but is actually against us. Can you first Corinthians this portion is chapter six, verse thirteen, please? Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Remember, fornication is seated in the nature and senses, yet it isn't made for the body or senses, so it fights against us as it's in a place where it ought not to be, seeking to take control. Let's look at the desire of the eyes to get understanding of the good versus the evil desire. Can we read Hermas Mandate 12, chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, and then we'll go on chapter 2. Yeah, just do that part first, please. On the Shepherd of Hermes, Matthew 12, chapter 1, verse 1. He saith to me, Remove from thyself all evil desire, and clothe thyself in the desire which is good and holy. For clothed with this desire, thou shalt hate the evil desire, and shalt bridle and direct it as thou wilt. For the evil desire is wild, and only tame with difficulty. For it is terrible. And by its wildness is very costly to men. More especially if a servant of Allah get entangled in it and have no understanding, he is put to fearful cost by it. But it is costly to such men as are not clothed in the good desire, but are mixed up with this life. These men then it hands over to death. Notice he said, if a servant of Ahim get in a tangled in it and has no understanding, that lets you know he got caught up in the spirit of fornication. Because in fornication is no understanding. Fornication leads to this evil desire. Now let's see the works that the evil desire does once fornication gets us in it, please. Of what sort, sir, say I? Are the works of the evil desire, which hand over men to death. Make them known to me, that I may hold aloof from them. Listen, saith he, through what works the evil desire bringeth death to the servants of Elohim. Before all is desire for the wife or husband of another, and for extravagance of wealth, and for many needless dainties, and for drinks and other luxuries, many and foolish, for even luxury is foolish and vain for the servants of Elohim. These desires then are evil and bring death to the servants of Elohim. For this evil desire is a daughter of the devil. Ye must therefore abstain from the evil desires that so abstaining you may live unto Allah mm -hmm. But as many as are mastered by them and resist them not are done to death utterly, for these desires are deadly. Notice she's a daughter of the devil. And fornication is mother of all evils. As you can see in that household of Satan, Look at the works that fornication's daughter gets us to do. Before all is the desire for the wife or husband of another. 
fornication, leading us right into adultery through her daughter. We get to see that this family actually works together to get us to fall. So, in spiritual fornication, the desire for extravagance of wealth is there. Needless dainties. The desire for it. And we talked about that um, insatiable and of the belly. See how fornication's daughter of evil desire helps that insatiableness of the belly with the desire for many needless dainties, eating beyond what we need and having more than we need. And for drinks and for other luxuries, many and foolish. But for us, it helps us know even luxury is foolish and vain for the servants of Allah Hayyam. We, if we're not there, we got to work to get to where we're really content with enough to eat and our raiment. We don't actually need luxury, need extra. Oh. We got to work to get there because if we don't get to that place of contentment, these desires of this daughter of the devil, they bring death to us. So we have to abstain from her to live unto Allah Hayyam. But as many as are mastered by them and resist them not are done to death utterly, for these desires are deadly. These desires, they take over our perception and how we see and what we look for. We have a covetous eye lust enough for other people's spouse, designed to have worldly wealth, worldly gain, designed to have things we don't need, whether it be food, or drinks, or other luxuries. Our eyes would be covetous. That's why the scripture said there's nothing more wicked than the eye. And we have to work on that perception to be for Allah in a good desire, not to let this one have place, this evil daughter. And how can we have that good perception if you continue in verse 4? I believe that's where you are unless you had a comment. Mm -mm, where I am. But do thou clothe thyself in the desire of righteousness, and having armed thyself with the fear of the Lord, resist them. For the fear of Allah I am dwelleth in a good desire. If the evil desire shall see thee armed with the fear of Allah I am in resisting itself, it shall flee far from thee, and shall no more be seen of thee, being in fear of thine arms. Notice there, she has to see you actually resisting her. So the evil desire is going to come. She's going to speak. Fornication, these evils, they're going to say what they have to say. They're going to tempt with what they tempt with. But we actually have to resist them. having the desire for righteousness and we have to pray to Allah Hayyam to help us and be in a space where we can actually call on to him with our whole heart for help and then they will flee if we're intemperate in our emotions it's not going to help us get out of it They have to see us armed with the fear of the Lord, wanting to do right with our whole heart. Continue, please. Do thou therefore, when thou art crowned for thy victory over it, Come to the desire of righteousness and deliver to her the victor's prize which thou hast received and serve her according as she herself desireth. If thou serve the good desire and art subject to her, thou shalt have power to master the evil desire 
and to subject her according as thou wilt. I would fain know, sir, say I, in what way thou art to serve the good desire? Listen, saith he, practice righteousness and virtue, truth and the fear of the Lord, faith and gentleness, and as many good deeds are like these. Practice in these, thou shalt be well pleasing as a servant of Allah, and shalt live unto him. Yea, and every one who shall serve the good desire shall live unto Allah. All right. We got to get to serving the good desire to get over and get mastery and power over the evil desire. But in order to actually serve her, the good desire, the good spirit, we have to practice. We have to do. We have to learn just like in you're practicing any craft. You have to keep at it, working at it to actually get a grip of it. We have to practice righteousness and virtue and truth and fear of the Lord and being gentle and faithful. And whatever good deeds are aligned with that so that we'll be well pleasing and live unto him and we'll actually get that good desire to be with us. Have a desire for righteousness. So that will be delivered from the evil desire. So that one, thankfully, to overcome the evil desire, the solution isn't hard. We have to practice righteousness. We have to work. We have to work hard and overcome the things that the evil desire likes so that she doesn't have any of her works in us to help replenish her, or refresh her, to keep her place. Okay. Anything else there, Zachwa? Yeah, the um as far as the good desire, it said um practice righteousness and virtue, truth and the fear of the Lord, faith and gentleness, and as many good deeds are like these. So actually putting forth your labors and the fruits of the spirit, putting forth your labors in the law will actually bring forth good. And this is what I was speaking to my son about today. We were talking about the spirit of pride and how pride won't allow you to keep the commandments. Like um, if you're, there's certain things that show that you're actually not keeping the commandments because one, if you're operating in pride, there's no way you can keep the commandments because Pride is the beginning of when one uh, departed from Allah. So there's no way that you can be keeping the commandments or walking in the fruits of the spirit when pride is involved. And fornication is very similar. Um, if there's no way. So when it said practice, so you actually have to start practicing these things to be able to weed out the evil desires um, because what happens is, is, once you put on, let's say, humility and long suffering, you start practicing those. You start replacing the evil desires. And when Casa was talking about earlier in the lesson about things being um hereditary, when it talks about things being hereditary, um, usually when things are hereditary, it's either something that you picked up from your youth, from your um from your place of residence with your family or something that you picked up from um, your descendants or your tribe. And for that, it, it shows that, um, that once things become habitual or they become a pattern, um, you actually have to practice to come out of them. Because what comes easy is going to be the thing that is habitual or the thing that um, you're going to struggle with. But as far as um, coming out of those things, you actually have to implement and start practicing the opposite 
of what it is that you're struggling with so that you can actually replace that thing or that struggle with what's right. Thank you, brother. When you're ready, can you go into the sleep attacks? Let's look at how fornication and the spirits against us attack us in our sleep, please. And with all these, the spirit of sleep is joined, which is that of error and fantasy. And so perisheth every young man, darkening his mind from the truth. And not understanding the law of Elohim, nor obeying the admonitions of his fathers, as befell me also in my youth. So, this can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. One spirit that helps in all this, you have um, envy. It helps lead us astray. Especially in sleep too. Um, there's a few spirits. You got the insatiableness of the belly, the overeating it affects our sleep. And along with this errant fantasy, let's see how envy and jealousy plays in our sleep. Can you we're speaking on envy here in Testament of Simeon chapter four, verse eight, please. But this maketh savage the soul, and destroyeth the body. It causeth anger and war in the mind, and stirreth up unto deeds of blood, and leadeth the mind into a frenzy, and suffereth not prudence to act in men. Moreover, it taketh away sleep, and causeth to moat to the soul, and trembling to the body. For even in sleep some malicious jealousy, deluding him, gnawing, and with wicked spirits disturbeth his soul and causeth the body to be troubled, and waketh the mind from sleep and confusion, and as a wicked and poisonous spirit, so appeareth it to men. Let's well, see. Spiritual fornication affects our sleep, our health, and our mental health as well. But if we actually do right by Allah, like Zach was talking about, implementing the laws and doing them to overcome that evil desire it'll even help us from our sleep troubles if you read proverbs chapter 3 verse 1 to 8 and then verse 21 to 24 please my son forget not my law but let thy heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of Allah and men. Trust in Ahia with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear Ahia and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 21. My son, let not them depart from thy eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. So, if we focus on practicing righteousness and keeping Allah commandments from our heart, it's work, and eventually we're going to attain unto that good desire. And Allah is going to deliver from that evil desire and the spirit of fornication. And we'll see the benefits in our health, in our life, and in our sleep. All right. So it's just some admonitions for starters. We're going to talk about more things as we get along down the line. For this portion, let's hear Abraham's admonition for us since we are all seeking to attain of being the children of Abraham through faith and by faith. 
and Yahshua Christ. Uh, Jubilee chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. Then verse 5 to 8, please. Jubilee chapter 20, verse 1. Abraham called Ishmael and his twelve sons, and Isaac and his two sons, and the six sons of Keturah and their sons. And he commanded them that they should observe the way of Ahiah, that they should work righteousness and love each his neighbor, and act on this manner amongst all men, that they should each so walk with regard to them to do judgment and righteousness on the earth and not deviate to the right hand or to the left all the path which Ahia hath commanded us, and that we should keep ourselves from all fornication and uncleanness, and renounce from amongst us all fornication and uncleanness. And he told them of the judgment of the giants, and the judgment of the sodomites, and how they had been judged on account of their wickedness, and had died on account of their fornication and uncleanness, and mutual corruption through fornication. He understood it was through fornication all evil was happening. His spiritual fornication and idolatry is the beginning, cause, and end of all evil, as Solomon said. Continue, please, in verse 6. And guard yourselves from all fornication and uncleanness and from all pollution of sin. Catch that there, that sin pollutes us, as that pollution is considered adultery unto Allah Hayyam, having the wrong spirits at work in us, according to Hermes Mandate 4. We're going to touch later on on what adultery is in the sight of Allah Hayyam altogether. All right, continue, please. Least ye make our name a curse, and your whole life a hissing, and all your sons be destroyed by the sword. And you become a curse like Sodom, and all your remnant as the sons of Gomorrah. I implore you, my sons, love the Elohim of heaven, and cleave ye to all his commandments, and walk not after their idols and after their uncleannesses. Don't follow those spirits that the heathen follow, as worshiping those idols by doing their works as spiritual fornication walking in uncleanness through the vain doctrines of the unbelievers. Continue, please. And make not for yourselves moat in a grave in Alahams. It's evil spirits leading us to do so, so we shouldn't do it. In the Acts of Thomas chapter 76, this devil talks about how when we make images that it's more evil spirits that are coming into that. In Acts of Thomas chapter 76, if you would read that portion, please. When the devil has said these things, and even more, the apostle said, Yajit commands you and your son through me not to enter any more into the habitation of men. But go now and depart and dwell far apart from the territory of men. And the devil said unto him, You have punished us harshly with your commandment. But what are you going to do about the others that are hidden from you? These people of India have created all types of images. Rejoice in them far more than what you do. Many of these people do mostly worship and perform their own will, sacrificing to these images and bringing them gifts of food by libations and by wine, water and offering with oblations. So we see creating type, all types of images, unlawful images, there are spirits that dwell in them. So we can understand why Abraham, our father, has commanded us not to make molten or graven deities. All right? We just would be creating more dwelling places for evil spirits by making the images so we shouldn't do it. Continue in Jubilees 20 and 8, please. For they are vanity, and there is no spirit in them. There is no spirit of Allah Hayyam in them. That is, continue, please. For they are a work of men's hands. And all who trust in them, trust in nothing. Serve them not, nor worship them. But serve ye the Most High Allah. And worship him continually. And hope for his countenance always. And work uprightness and righteousness before him. That he may have pleasure in you. 
and grant you his mercy, and send rain upon you morning and evening, and bless all your works which ye are wrought upon the earth, and bless thy bread and thy water, and bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, and the herds of thy cattle and the flocks of thy sheep, and ye will be for a blessing on the earth, and all nations of the earth will desire you, and bless your sons in my name that they may be blessed as I am. As Abraham desires us to be blessed like him by abstaining from everything the spirit of fornication does, we will have to look into the works of the spirit. And that's what we're going to do in going forward in this series of discussions. All right. Hope this was edifying for you all and not only this discussion as we keep building, we get good understanding insight as to all the works of the spirit of fornication and what all goes with that and the other spirits, her children that go with her, so that we can be able to keep ourselves from her and actually attain unto our salvation in Yache Christ. Um that's all I got for the moment. You got anything else, Zachwa? Yeah, we're um uh... Working on being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So Allah and prosper us and giving us understanding, especially here in this um, generation where we have to be strengthened in righteousness and coming out of the world and the things that we have thought as normal now to come to the understanding of Elohim, to have a new perspective and a new viewpoint of life and what's right and wrong. So Elohim prosper us in our endeavor and our journey so that we can be built up and serving him. Elohim keep us. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us here at Hebrew Readers Church. We look forward to spending more time with you in the near future. Peace be upon you all. Shalom. Peace be upon you all. Shalom. HRC, 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 HRC,